I was a communist for the FBI. Starring Dana Andrews in an exciting tale of danger and espionage, I was a communist for the FBI. The story you are about to hear is based on the actual records and authentic experiences of Matt Sabetic, an undercover agent of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, who for nine fantastic years lived as a communist for the FBI. Here is our star, Dana Andrews as Matt Sabetic, undercover agent. Nine years of it. Nine years of living behind a mask that made me an outcast among my own people. And from behind that mask... I saw these things happen. It's all in the record. The story and testimony of my nine years as a communist for the FBI. In a moment, listen to Dana Andrews as Matt Savetic, FBI undercover agent. Dana Andrews as Matt Savetic, FBI undercover agent. This story from the confidential file is marked, I Walk Alone. Hello? I'd like to speak to Mr. Lawrence, please. Mr. Lawrence, Dick Lawrence. This is Dick Lawrence. Oh, this is Chuck. Chuck, how are you? Haven't heard from you. Haven't been able to get near a phone booth. Something doing? Will you be in the office after midnight? I could be. I may have something after the meeting tonight. Big? Some guy imported from Moscow or Bucharest is going to address our cell. He's supposed to have gotten his boot training practically with Uncle Joe himself. I'll call you right after the meeting breaks up and... Oh, honey, I... <laughs> I don't know when it'll break up. These shindigs last. Huh? Uh, probably too late to do much anyway. Well, uh, how about dinner Monday night and a, and a show or dancing or something? I get it. So long. Monday? Monday night okay? Okay, honey. It's a date. Bye. Going someplace, Maddie? Oh. Hiya, Simon. <laughs> I was having a sandwich at the soda fountain. Saw you go into the phone book. Yeah, just uh, calling a girl. Yeah, I... I came over to ask you to join me for a bite, and I couldn't help catching the end of it. Go back and finish your sandwich. Oh, what's the matter, comrade? You saw her? You know I was talking to my girl, and you stood there and tuned in. I have a private life, you know, Simon. Private life? After all these years in the party? <laughs> Come on. I'll walk with you to the meeting, comrade. Go together. I walk shoulder to shoulder with comrade Simon Horvath, thinking, yeah, we go together, but we walk alone. All these comrades, but never a friend among them. We go to a piano studio on Pine Street. We're the last to arrive... Besides the five members of our cell, there's a big man pacing the room. 
He looks at me and Comrade Horvath as though inspecting us for plague. He looked like real trouble to any decent, hard-working undercover man. Comrade Helen Worth makes the introductions, and the big man's name strikes some kind of chord with me. I... Comrade Ravchenko, Comrade Horvath and Savetic. Comrade Comrade Ravchenko. Comrade Ravchenko. Oh, what... Weren't you assigned to the Cleveland problem? Was I? Plugging secret information leaks. Plugging them poorly, it would seem. Sit down, though. <coughs> I have here three copies of a most important letter. <coughs> comrade Savitic. Yes, Comrade. Secretary of the American Slav Congress. That's right. Take this copy of the letter. Commit its contents to memory. When you've done so, return the letter to me. Yes, I understand. Here. Do not read it while I'm speaking. Oh, I'm sorry. Copy for Comrade Helen Worth. Thank you. Comrade Wilson. Now, briefly, first. Yes, Comrade Savetic, I was assigned to the Cleveland problem. I'm sorry if I've been out of order, Comrade. I... There have been serious information leaks to the FBI. Only in Cleveland? Everywhere. However, my visit is not relative to that matter, at least not exclusively. Those letters contain the names and assignments of several highly trained comrades assigned to vital industries in this area. Memorize the names and everything about them to the last detail. You will be their contacts. Clear? And does that mean that we'll receive secret instructions to be channeled to these people? Memorize the names and everything about them to the last detail. I know. You said that, comrade, but... I I'll... said that. And I said you will be their contacts. And that is all I said. Clear, comrade Savetic. Clear. Learn your men first. When we are prepared to issue orders for them, you'll receive those orders to pass on to them. Well, that's all I ask. That's all I wanted to know. That answers the questions. Why, why all the excitement? Shh, well, I mean, couldn't he just have told me? Comrade Savetic. I'm sorry. Comrade Savetic, how long have you been with us? Oh, I can vouch for Comrade Ravchenko. He joined us back... Comrade in... Savetic will answer. I joined the party in 1942. Did you join with any questions in your mind then? No. Any reservations? No. Doubts? No. Lack of belief in your leaders? No. Then why not keep that healthy state of acceptance? That will be all. Be available for sudden meetings. Go. Mr. Dick Lawrence, please. Lawrence speaking. Chuck. Go ahead. I can't talk to you over the telephone. Do you want to meet me someplace? No. I've got to be on call. I'm mailing you a letter along with my report. What letter? I can't talk. It'll knock you on your face, that's all. Use the new mail drop. Yeah, I know. Only look. Read the letter, copy it, or photostat it, or whatever you want to do it. Get it back to me quick. How about a couple of days? As soon as you can. I've got to give it back in a hurry. I heard you. A gold mine of commie saboteurs. Nuggets of no goods. Wait until you see this. They've got three of the boys in atom bomb installations. Commies and atom jobs? Don't say any more. Put your report and that letter in the drop as soon as possible. Any instructions? Yeah. Your new telephone designation is R-U-D-Y. Rudy. Got it. Your new contact name here is Mr. Fisher. Got it. Keep in touch. I'll try. Those guys suspect their own mothers. So long. I go back to my room at the hotel. I'm supposed to be living with my folks, but my folks don't want much part of the son who turned Kame and disgraced the family. That's the way it is. I type out my report, sign my current code number, enclose Revchenko's letter and address it to the new drop, a little barber shop in the Golden Triangle where it'll be picked up by an FBI agent. I go out to mail it, then come back to my room and bone up a little on the communist manifesto to look sharp to Revchenko. And then I go to sleep. In the morning, I go out to breakfast. Hey, Matty! My heart jumps. Comrade Horvath. Has he seen me come out of the hotel? Good morning, oh. comrade. Hello, Simon. 
How were you doing in the state hotel just now? <laughs> I'm peculiar. I eat. I was in the coffee shop. Don't you eat breakfast at home? No, I don't hang around home very much. You know that. My folks don't like a communist in the family. Time they get used to it. Yeah, it upsets mother. When you know how it is. No. How is it? Well, after all, she's my mother. <laughs> A nice bourgeois sentiment. And that's why I don't like the party to call me there. The family takes messages for him, but they sure don't like it much. They took one for you this morning. What? Didn't they tell you? No, I, I left pretty early. What time? What time did you call? I didn't. You just said Rev that you... Ravchenko could... called. What for? He's calling back all the letters. Well, he just issued them last night. He figures overnight to study them is enough. Well... When does he want the letter? He wants it two hours ago. Well, I... I don't have it. Huh? Well, not only that is, I don't carry it around. It's home. I'll go home with you. Well, I... I better call home first. All right. There's a drugstore. I'll go with you. Uh, why don't you go back and tell Revchenko I'll have the letter for him later today, this afternoon. Let's see if they found it back home. All right. I'll phone them. I'll go with you. How to call the FBI and not let Comrade Horvath at my elbow know who I'm talking to and what I'm trying to say. I get change from the cashier, stalling for time, trying to think of something. I dial, hoping that the Comrade doesn't notice that the exchange I dial isn't in the Stanley Avenue area. Lawrence is my con... No, it's Fisher now. Fisher, worse luck. Lawrence could sound like my brother's first name, but Fisher... My hand is shaking. Hello? 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 Uh, Fisher? Who? Oh, yes, I, I remember you. Aren't you the insurance man comes around once a month? Rudy? Yeah, that's right. Remember me? I, I said I didn't need insurance. I was going to live forever. <laughs> well, now I, I don't know. What's up? Is the mother there, Mr. Fisher? Go ahead. I I had an important letter yesterday. Will you ask Mom if I left it on my desk or someplace around? I I need it urgently. So soon? You said two days. W will you ask her now? We haven't got the letter anymore. What? We don't have the letter. Why? Well, what's wrong? You were right. It's big stuff. Stuff like that we have to send on to Washington and the original. Oh. A copy won't do. I'm sorry. Well... When do you think Mom will feel better? What? Oh, it uh, won't be back until tomorrow, at least. I see. I know this is a curve, but uh, you take it from here. Well, I... I don't know if I can see you right away, Mr. Fisher. I'm... I'm with a friend, and Mom doesn't entirely approve of my political friends. Save it. I knew you were being tagged right away. Well, you'll stay with Mom until she feels a little better, won't you? I'd really appreciate it. Sorry, Rudy. Goodbye, Mr. Fisher. Trouble? Yeah. Mother isn't feeling so well. Maybe I better go see her. What about Revchenko? Explain it to him for me, will you? Oh, no. Not me. Oh, he'll understand. Maybe you can make him understand, not me. What's so special about this Revchenko? Or Nikolaev. Nikolaev? Or Tomashevsky. Wasn't there a Tomashevsky who yeah. was out? Yeah. Yeah, What? Who used to be with the NKVD, now the MVD, the Communist International Secret Police. Revchenko. Alias this, alias that, yeah. Only we call him Comrade Revchenko. He's going to want to talk to you, Comrade Savetti. to Dana Andrews, starring in I Was a Communist for the FBI, and the second act of our story. That is all, Comrade Sovetic. That is your story. Yes, Comrade Revchenko. But no letter. But I, I've explained that I, I learned my mother was ill, and I can't decide if it's wise to visit her under the circumstances. The only wisdom is to produce the letter. Well, it... 
It may take time. She's ill and she resents me. My family... It is at your mother's house, you say? Yes, but I... I Get it. Very well. Comrade Harbath, go with him. First house past the lamppost, driver. 5102. Right here. That's right. Well, the flag driver will be right out. Now, look, Simon. You know how my family feels about my going with communists. Why don't I go in first and see how Mother feels and then sort of get her used to the idea of bringing another communist into the house, huh? Well, make it short. This taxi is on you, don't forget. Come in, Matty. Who waits outside in the taxi? He's a friend of mine, Mom. Friend? Mom, I've come to ask a very big favor of you. Oh, you got some trouble, yeah. Pretty big trouble, yeah. What favor? You won't like this, and I hate to ask it. I, I want you to tell that man in the taxi that you think you burned a letter of mine you found around yesterday. I should lie for you. I, I said you wouldn't like it. You left the letter I found yesterday, and I burned it. And remember, it was in a yellow envelope. In yellow envelope. You didn't read any of it, naturally. This much at least is truth. He knows you don't like communists, so it'll look all right if you're unfriendly to him. Ma? Ma? Oh, that's cheap. Oh, hello, Ma. Who's that in the taxi outside? Hello, Tip. How have you been? Who's the guy in the taxi, Mom? I said, hello, Tip. One of your crummy friends? He wants to talk to Mom. Mom doesn't want to talk to him. Yes, Tippy. Why? Now keep out of this, Tip. Why should I? Just keep out. Will you keep out of it? You don't know what's going on, so keep out. I don't know what's going on. No. Oh, boy, I don't know what's going on. I'll call Simon in. Stay Mom. where you are, Matt. Tippy, he's your brother. He's in trouble. If he's in trouble with his chums, he asks for it. If he's in bad with the cops or the FBI, let his chums get him out of it. Huh, Matt? Simple, elementary, wise guy? Tip, he's your brother. He's not my brother while he's there, comrade. Look, Tip, we've had this out before. Comrade. I'm in a jam, all right. I want out of it, and I won't bother you again. Just, just this once, and I won't disgrace you anymore. Get out. Tip. He's older than you. And in the old country... In the, the old older... country? This is the new country. This is the country some of my buddies got hurt and killed for. And this here... This... This... Now watch it, Tip. Watch it. Boy. Boy. So you have to start fun. something every time, don't you? You're lucky the rest of the family's at work. You know Mom isn't well and you start something. Mom isn't well. Oh, brother. Please. You're the one to holler Mom isn't well. Why isn't she well? No, that's a beauty, all right. You're the one to talk. No, Tip. I'm all through talking. Mom isn't well. Sure she isn't well. Oh, sure, you're killing her. Dear, now, dear. get out! Get out before I hurt you. That's fine, Tip. Go on. All right, Tip. I wouldn't want my kid brother to hurt me. All right. Goodbye, Mom. If that's your comrade, tell him we aren't having any. All right, hothead. You're the big man today. Matty. Tell your friend to come in. Thanks, Mom. You'll excuse me, won't you, comrade? He looks swell in that Navy uniform, doesn't he? Matty, Matty, answer the door. Mom tells Comrade Horvath her simple fiction so convincingly that I almost believe it. He seems satisfied, but he isn't Revchenko. On the way back to headquarters, the taxi stops for a light. A newsboy waves a paper at us through the window. I don't hear the kid, I just see the headline. The words rush out at me in type that gets bigger and blacker and louder until it explodes right in my face. Simple words that could be my obituary. FBI seizes Red Adam saboteurs. Holy... Where did they get that? 
Yeah, I wonder. You still insist that the letter was burned, Comrade Sovetic? That's what I say, Comrade Revchenko. And that's what my mother told Comrade Horvath. Sure, she said it, and it sounds good. I wasn't at the cremation, however. How do you account for the story in the newspapers, Comrade Sovetic? I don't know. You don't know? Well, we have leaks in the organization. He doesn't know, Comrade Horvath. Huh? Yes, Comrade Sovetic, we have leaks in the organization. We try to plug them. The best way we can. Copies of this letter went to three of us. Why aren't you grilling the other two? One at a time, comrade. And one thing at a time, and first things first. Huh? Why do I rate top priority, comrade? The others returned their letters promptly when ordered. You did not. They had their letters overnight. Plenty of time to inform the press or... Or... Or the FBI. Comrade, do you suggest that some member of your cell has turned traitor? You are suggesting, aren't you? You're accusing me of treason, aren't you? Has either one of us used the word treason to you? No. Or betrayal? No. Turncoat spy, has either of us cried undercover agent? FBI? No. Then why do you? The implication is certainly strong enough. It is your inference that is strong, Comrade Sovetic. And it makes me wonder why. Why do you feel accused when we are merely trying to search out an information leak? Then don't act as if you suspect me. We don't. No. A little discipline, comrade. Some respect, if respect. you please. Respect. Sit down, comrade. Respect. You're excited. All right, I'm excited. I'm mad. Nerves? I've given years of my life to the party. I've pounded picket lines for the party and helped man your goon squads and gotten stoned and spat at for you. I've proved my loyalty to the 7th International in every possible way. I don't have a life of my own. My life belongs to the party. I hardly have a home. Where my own mother won't have me. Where my kid brother hates me because they think I've brought shame on the family and an early grave to my mother. Uh, yeah. I can see it on her. I can't help it, though. I, I believe in... I believe in what I'm doing, and that's all. Just so. Yeah. You're excused, Comrade Zavetic. I can go? For the time being. Uh, when does the decision come off on this? Don't worry. We've been working on it while we chatted here. Working on it? Excuse, Tovarish. What do you mean, working? You may go, comrade. I leave. I'm not kidding myself that my outburst of indignation is full. It will hinge on the work they were doing while we chatted, whether I get disciplined or not call it discipline. I don't dare go to my hotel. I know I'm being watched. I've got to go to my folks' home on Stanley Avenue because that's where the comrades think I live. So I go home again. Call it home. Marty. Well, I had to come back, Mom. Oh, come in, son, quick. Well, what's the matter? Nothing. Two men were here. Who? I don't know. They said FBI. FBI? Briefcases, yes. What do they want? Tell me. They, they said fine things about you, Marty. Well, what fine things? Tell me. Wonderful things. How you were not really a communist at all, but the FBI fellow. They told you that? How you were showing them up pretending to be one of them, risking dishonor and things. What fine thing you were doing for your country. Fine things, they said. Oh, Mom, don't, <laughs> please. What did you say? Say the truth. They lied, but I told them the truth. I told them you were a communist. She told them the truth. I'm glad she didn't know the truth. And this was why the FBI had told me never to tell anybody that I was a communist for the FBI. Least of all, my own mother. Because one day two nice men with briefcases would come along and pay their respects to Mom and tell her what a fine job her son was doing for the FBI, pretending to be a commie. And Mom's heart would burst with joy and relief and pride 
and she'd fall for the two smiling communist agents and their nice briefcases and FBI credentials. And her son would die in the gutter or some stinking black waterfront or just disappear. That's how it would be if Mom ever knew the truth about me. I told them the truth. But I wish, I pray to God that they were right. But they were wrong. I'm sorry, Mom. Wrong, those... Those two communists. You knew. Who else would say such lies to me? Oh, I'm sorry, Mom. That's the way it is, though. Goodbye, Mom. Marty. Yeah? Call me up once in a while, son. Yeah. And that's how it is to be me. You live in shadow. You're two people, and you're nobody. Your own family casts you out. There's nobody you can turn to. That's how it is with me, but I ask for it. I'm a communist for the FBI. I walk alone. star, Dana Andrews, will return in a moment. This is Dana Andrews. Some of these stories we bring you are so strange and fantastic, it's difficult to believe that they really happened. Of course, for obvious reasons, names, dates, and localities have been changed. But our stories are based on the real-life experiences of Matt Savetic, and they did happen here. Next week, we'll go back to his file for another exciting adventure. We hope you'll join us then. I was a communist for the FBI. Starring Dana Andrews in an exciting tale of danger and espionage, I was a communist for the FBI. Many of the incidents in the story you are about to hear are based on the actual records and authentic experiences of Matt Savetic, who for nine fantastic years lived as a communist for the FBI. Here is our star, Dana Andrews, as Matt Savetic. Burn a candle at both ends, and the candle lasts half as long. I did it for nine years. For nine years, I lived two lives as opposite as day and night, life and death. Sometimes living a double life brings death just twice as close and closer. It did for me many times. Well, I was a communist for the FBI. In a moment, listen to Dana Andrews as Matt Savetic, Undercover Man. Andrews as Matt Sabetic, undercover man. 
This story from his confidential file is marked, I Can't Sleep. Yes? Mr. Baker, please, right away. Who's calling, Mr. Baker? Tom Roberts. Come on, get on it. This is Baker. Go ahead. I've got to see you right away. I'm heading for a conference with the big wheel, and if it's about what I think it is, I'd better talk to you. Where are you calling from? Drugstore phone booth. Then let me do the talking. Do you think the meeting might be about Otto Janus? They say it was suicide. I think it was murder. Never mind what you think. Let the comrades think you believe it was suicide. Was it? Look, Matt, go to that conference with Buchek, but watch yourself. You may be in a tough spot. I have a funny feeling I'm on the same spot Otto Janis was before he got here. Go to the meeting, then meet me on the southwest corner of 9th and Viaduct. Okay. Watch yourself. Watch yourself. I wonder as I walk toward Communist headquarters for my meeting with Joseph Buchek, was Otto Janis told to watch himself before they found him dead? My footsteps echo the cadence of a name familiar to Americans who read good books. Otto Janus. Otto Janus, author. Critic. Otto Janus. Author, farewell, Nero. Author, citizen, Slav. Author, trumpet, the brave country. History. Immigrant. Patriot. Communist party member. Corpse. Found hanging pitifully in his hotel room in New York City. Why such an end to such a man? How? That's what Joseph Buchek wants to talk to me about. Little Joe. Very close to Big Joe himself in the Kremlin. Watch yourself, Savetic. Comrade Savetic, I have work for you. Always ready, comrade, as you know. As you know, the party has just suffered a great loss in the tragic death of the head of our Slovene Bureau in New York. We were all shocked to hear about Comrade Janus. Found hanging in his hotel room. I uh, know. Tragic. The papers say suicide. The capitalist press says suicide while it implies murder. They seem to implicate the party. Yes, only they can. Well, the answer is to prove that it was suicide. Yes, only we can. Your assignment, Comrade Sibetic, is to go to New York and establish that Comrade Janus hanged himself. After all, why should we murder one of our most trusted comrades? Yes, Sibetic? When do I leave? I asked you. Why, it's manifestly ridiculous to think we made away with Janus. As you say, why should we? Unless he was an FBI agent, which I'm sure he was not. You leave tonight. I'd better wire for a hotel reservation. A reservation is ready for you. The Santa Braddock Hotel. May I ask, just how do I go about proving that Otto Janus killed himself, if the police are in doubt? You will receive instructions in New York. Very well. Where you will deliver three separate addresses to the meeting of the press committees on newspaper propaganda. Have to stay three days in New York? Where you will also report to the Sovian Bureau as the new acting chief. Me? Replace Otto Janus? Why not? You knew him. You sometimes checked his manuscripts for political reliability. You're one of his nationality. What is more natural than that you should succeed, our mourned comrade, temporarily. So the meeting was about Otto Janus, eh, Matt? Yeah. Can the FBI answer a big question for me? I don't know, Savetic. What's the question? Was Janus an undercover agent, like myself? I can't answer that. Why are they really sending me to New York? We want to know, too. We'll give you all the help we can. Watch yourself, Savetic. <laughs> I tried to sleep, sitting up on the night coach to New York, thinking, did Otto Janus wear two faces like myself? How did he die? Suicide or cleverly disguised murder? Over and over again, round and around. I can't sleep. And then, mercifully, I do fall asleep. Oh, 
I'll hey, how's that, stranger? Dennis. Roger Dennis. Yeah, yeah. Get off my shoulder, huh? <laughs> Suicide. Hey. Suicide. Uh, hey, fellow, wake up. Watch this. Watch this. Watch this. Hey, wake up, what? guy, will you? Huh? What? Are you always talk in your sleep. Talk. What did I say? I, I don't know. Butchers or something. What else? What else? I don't know. Just mumbling, I guess, and butchers. Oh. Hey, hey, what's the matter? You got a beef against butchers? Not that I know of. Oh. Well, excuse me, will you? Don't let me keep you awake. That's all right. I've had enough sleep. Plenty. <laughs> sit up tensely all night. I never used to talk in my sleep. Maybe it's beginning to get me. In the morning, bleary-eyed and stubble-chinned, I check into the hotel in New York. It's a nice double room with twin beds, an unusual extravagance for the party. But I'm a big man now. I don't wait to unpack before I pick up the phone to check with communist headquarters. Report in. Operator, will you give me Sheridan 371... Never mind that number, operator. Thanks. Yeah, come in. Uh, Mr. Medic? Yes. Who are you? Uh, uh, who am I? <laughs> Look at these suitcases. I'm your dormitory mate. That's who I am. Uh, dormitory mate? Uh, Carp. Comrade Carp. With a K. I wasn't told I'd have a roommate when I got here. I'm attending the press committee's meeting, same as you, comrade. i got to use the telephone. Excuse me. Yeah. Uh, Hello, operator. Wait a minute. Uh, Hang up. Well, I've got a report. Hang up. (laughs) I like you, comrade. I like you. You don't take no for an answer. eh? I want to know more about you before I split a room with you. Yeah, well, Carp is the name. With a K, I know. And that's all I know so far. That's why I'm calling headquarters, comrade. So we can both check on each other. eh? (laughs) You see? (laughs) Uh, hey, wage slave. <laughs> How about Sheridan 37115? I sit on one of the beds as Carp with a K talks to Communist headquarters and establishes beyond question his right to be here. Then I report and get my orders for the day. While I talk, I size up Carp. I study his luggage. And all at once, the cold sweat starts all over my body. One piece of luggage is a battered suitcase, but the other is a big, powerful tape sound recorder. I finish my call and hang up frozenly. A sound recorder? Why? I'm going to spend three nights in this room with Comrade Carp, and I'm the undercover boy who's taken lately to talking in his sleep. And all at once, I wonder who the man beside me in the train was. Was he sent to watch me too? Did he tip off the party to send Comrade Carp to haunt me? With a tape recorder? I don't know. I don't know. Or don't I? Yes, yeah, sir, you're comrade uh, Savetic, eh? <laughs> you tell me you were a friend of Artigenis. A comrade is more like it, in the strict party sense only. Yeah. Why do you suppose he bumped himself off anyway? That's what I'm here to find out. How are you going to get at the facts? Comrade Buchek said I'd receive instructions how to proceed when I got here. Yeah. You're getting your instructions now, comrade. Your instructions are that comrade Otto Janus committed suicide. I understand. You were here to meet with the press committees this afternoon to plan the spreading of that fact among the Slav element in America. Give me the line on Janus, then. All right, he was a sensitive artist. He was in ill health. He'd been worrying about the precipice of chaos and war to which capitalistic aggression was leading his beloved adopted country. All right. I wish Buchek had been more specific with me, that's all. <laughs> so Comrade Buchek was specific with me, and I'm specific with you. <laughs> Same difference. Uh, comrade, yeah? what's the tape recorder for? Oh, that? Oh, uh, record the minutes of the meeting, copy them down later. Why? Oh, well, I'm sort of a high-fidelity sound hobbyist myself. That's a good machine. Yeah, sensitive as the human ear. And it works while you sleep, Yeah. What do you mean? Works while you sleep. Hey, wait a minute. You kidding? <laughs> Think I'm going to stay awake during all that palaver if I can grab 40 winks while this machine listens in? Good idea. Yeah. 
Well, I'm going to grab some sleep right now, immediately and at once. Yeah. Me too, comrade. I'm tired, all right. Dead dog tired, and I'd love to sleep. But I can't. I've become an unstable character who wakes up screaming beside strangers in railroad coaches. I'm the man with two faces, a communist for the FBI, opening slightly at the scenes. I've got three nights ahead of me in New York with Comrade Carp in the same room with me, listening. And if he doesn't listen, that sensitive machine has ears. Oh, yeah. I'm dead. Dog tired. I don't dare sleep for three more whole days and nights. Suppose I talk. I don't dare sleep. to Dana Andrews, starring in I Was a Communist for the FBI, and the second act of our story. The war of nerves is on. One night up on the train, last night's sleeplessness. Two more endless nights ahead of me, and never, never out of sight of the comrades so I can snatch a moment's sleep. I can't last through that. Nobody can. Only, I've got to. Two in the morning. The second night. I'm fighting off sleep like some overpowering drug. Carp, jolly, jolly comrade, is sleeping lightly. But sleeping. He sleeps. When he gets too tired to sleep lightly, he'll plug in that tape recorder and sleep heavily. Sure. Three o'clock. And I can't take this anymore. I can't. I, I can't stay awake. I've got to do something or go mad or kill myself. Something. Operator. Operator, give me room service. No. No, give me the drugstore. The... Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Hello? Drugstore? Look. I know there's a kind of... Uh, a kind of tablet... A tablet they take when they want to stay awake on, on long drives, you know? I said there's a kind of tablet. I can't speak any louder. I, I might wake up my comrade, my partner. I said, have you got those those stay awake tablets they use when... Hey, it's the verdict. Oh, never mind then. Thanks, anyhow. Hey. Who are you talking to there, Savetic? Drugstore, that's all. Yeah? What time is it? Four o'clock. Four o'clock. I, I can't sleep. I asked him to send up some sleeping pills. Sleeping pills? Yeah. Sleeping pills? Yeah. Why? Why? Don't you know you can't buy those things without a doctor's prescription? Oh, yeah, sure. So the pharmacist told me. Hmm. <laughs> ah, relax, relax. Take yourself a glass of lukewarm water. Let yourself go limp and relax. Okay, I'll try that. Hey, you'll sleep. Thanks, Cameron. You wish it. Uh, night. Cheerful risers, aren't you? <laughs> Trying to get some sleep, comrade? Mm, some. <laughs> the boy. Yeah, I'll be out of here in two shakes. Hmm? <laughs> hey, hey, Sabetic, wake up. I wasn't asleep. <laughs> Come on, arise and shine, boy. Arise and shine.
managed to stumble and mumble through my work during the day. All day into the evening, part of the night, finishing up our stay. Work, a party, down with them and up with us. Up. Up. I've been up. I've been up three days and three nights now. I can't see straight. I don't know if I can take it again. And I can't shake the comrades to steal an hour's sleep somewhere. I want to scream at them. I want to yell at them to go away and leave me alone. Let me sleep or I'll go crazy or I'll... Or I'll... Rather than fall asleep and talk, kill myself. The fourth night. Agony. Let me go. FBI. FBI. I hate the FBI. I hate him. I hate him. Let me go. Let me go. Let me go. I sit up in bed. I've been asleep. I've been asleep and I've talked. I know I've talked. I heard myself. I woke myself up with it. FBI, I said. I heard it. Did he? I looked over at Carp, a jolly comrade. He's asleep, but his mechanical stooge isn't. Carp's limp hand is wound round a toggle switch, and the wire leads under the bed to the sound recorder. With my sleep talking on the tape, there's only one thing to do. I do it. Creep out of bed, belly close to the floor. Slither under Carp's bed. Stop the recorder. Erase the sound from the tape magnetically. Wait an eternity for the reel to wind back and erase the tape. Carp tosses in his sleep. I freeze. Silence again. Then, carefully, I start the recorder normally again. Creep back into my bed. This time, Severic. This time, keep awake. If it killed you. Because if you don't keep awake, it may kill you too. Get that, Semitic. You get it. Get it. All right. Okay. Yeah? Tom Roberts? You've got the wrong room. No, no, this is Mr. Baker from out of town. Baker? Try to meet me in front of the main library on Fifth Avenue, understand? I heard you, yes. There's no Roberts here, and I don't know a Mr. Baker. You've got the wrong room. Goodbye. Party work is done by noon. Getting away to meet Baker is easy now. I find him sitting on the steps of the library near one of the marble lions. Hometown boy, am I glad to see you. We don't talk. We take a cab and go to an office in the West 40s. And there, Baker unlimbers a portable recorder of his own. Starts it rolling. That sounds familiar to you? Just a lot of traffic noises far away. The FBI here knew about the meeting and which room you have. We wired the room the first night you arrived. What did you find out, if anything? Listen. Oh, well, I know that sound by now. No. I don't care. Let me go. Let me go. That sounds like me. Yeah, that's you, all right. FBI. FBI. I hate the FBI. I hate him. I hate him. Let me go. Let me go. Let me go. Cut. You picked that up last night? You uh, talked in your sleep. I know. I tried to stay awake, but I couldn't. It just so happens that you couldn't have said anything more in your favor if your roommate overheard you. He didn't. His tape recorder did. 
And to think I crawl in a carp's bed to erase that stuff. They'd have loved me in the Kremlin. You erased it? Well, how did I know what I'd babbled in my sleep? And you started the machine again? Naturally. Sovetic, look alive. What's the matter? Carp knows when he started that machine. When he hears the clock on that tape striking three and four, he'll know the tape was erased and started over again. He'll know who did it and why you did it. And suspect the worst. Fine. Uh, we all make mistakes. Yeah. We've taken the room next to yours. If anything happens, we'll try to help you. Thanks. I said we'll try. Thanks. So long, Baker. Oh, come in, comrade. Come in. <laughs> Just running off some tape, I exposed last night. That's so? Yeah, I don't know what I caught. So far, nothing. What did you expect to catch? Yeah. All I got is traffic from outside. <laughs> oh, wait. Yeah. Steeple clock. I watch Cart's rapt face as the clock on the tape strikes three. He keeps on smiling. But I know these people, the comrades. I know them so well that I know the verdict on Otto Janus' death. Suicide. I know that he, too, must have been on the spot and chose suicide rather than endure the maddening torture the comrades could inflict. I knew Otto Janus hanged himself, because I almost came to that. Verdict? Suicide. Mission accomplished. Boy, there's a real late sailing. Ship held up with the fog, likely. Probably. <laughs> you know, these things are a lot of use. A lot of fun, too, Semitic. And then, all at once, the truth hits me. I know that the clock chiming three on the tape when it shouldn't chime more than two hasn't rung any bells with Comrade Karp. And I know something else, and know it right. And that is that the myth of the new Soviet man's wit and cunning is a myth. We can be as smart as they are, and they can be as dense as we are any time of the day or in the dead of the night. So long, Comrade Karp. Hey, where to, Comrade? Hey, wait. How about 40 winks before we catch the train back? Oh, me? I feel fine. I'm going for a walk. I don't know if Otto Janus was an FBI agent playing communist, like myself, or not. I think the comrades thought so and gave him some treatment like my own. And he killed himself rather than take it anymore. At least that's my conclusion. It makes me think. Walk carefully, Svetic. Walk carefully and walk alone. It might have been you. Star Dana Andrews will return in a moment. This is Dana Andrews. The story you've just heard is just one of many that make the life of an undercover agent exciting and adventurous from a nice, safe distance. For obvious reasons, names, dates, and places have been changed, but our stories are based on the real-life experiences of Matt Svetic. Next week, we open his file for another exciting adventure. Join us then, won't you?
I was a communist for the FBI. Starring Dana Andrews in an exciting tale of danger and espionage, I was a communist for the FBI. The story you are about to hear is based on the actual records and authentic experiences of Matt Savetic, an undercover agent of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, who for nine fantastic years lived as a communist for the FBI. Here is our star, Dana Andrews, as Matt Savetic, undercover agent. You can read it in the official report, the whole story of my life as a communist for the FBI. I was in the party. I saw it work. For nine years, I recorded the communist conspiracy against the United States from within. This is part of the story. In a moment, listen to Dana Andrews as Matt Savetic, FBI undercover agent. Here is Dana Andrews as Matt Savetic, FBI undercover agent. This story from the confidential file is marked Little Red Schoolhouse. Hey! Watch where you're walking. What are you trying to do, chum? Live dangerously? I'm sorry, mister. Yeah, I'm nuts. Excuse me, buddy, but have you got a match? Sure, yeah. Thanks. Keep them. It's a red nine today. Tomorrow's red eight. Hello, Matt. It's been a long time since we worked together. When did you get transferred from Detroit, Ed? A month ago. Oh, here comes our car. Hop back with me. Okay, Quine, take off. Let's make it fast. You know how the party checks on my time. Well, I wish we could offer you more protection, Matt, but... I know. I'm on my own. The report... A new Soviet agent has arrived from Linyan going training in propaganda and infiltration. I'm one of them. And this new Soviet agent? Is going to meet with us for briefing and an assignment to some important jobs. Anything else? Meeting place is to be changed. This new Soviet agent isn't taking any chances. I don't even know his name yet. When do you meet him? Tonight, six. Better drop me off now. Mm-hmm. Any place along here. Yeah, pull it up, Gwen. Any last instructions? Yes, Matt, I want a full report by mail. Also, let me know by phone, if you can, the name of this new agent and the location of your meeting place. I'll let you know, Matt, is it? Matt, get him quick. Huh? Sure. What's up? That man, walking away from the corner. He was watching us. Who is he? Vasily Konostoy, a suspected Soviet agent. He's new here. We had him in the office for a routine check. You? Ed, that makes him the boy from Linyan Institute. Yes, very possibly. He knows I'm FBI, so you'd better start praying he didn't get a good look at you with me. If he did and he recognizes you later... Spare the details. I know what'll happen. I'm in the party, remember? Whether Ed Grayson remembered or not, I did. It was the price of my life. When six o'clock came, I was picked up and driven to a small, isolated red brick house. Inside were five people... Four men and a girl. Introductions told me the girl's name was Stephanie. And seating arrangements put us together in a corner. Close up, her dark loveliness was almost like a blow. Comrade Matt. Comrade Matthew. No, I like Comrade Matt better. Hard, tough, like you. It's a tough world, Comrade Stephanie. No room for softness. We're nothing. The party and its beliefs are everything. Do you disagree with that? (laughs) Of course not, Comrade Matt. It's only that being near you makes me feel like a woman. Is that so terrible? That's dangerous talk. I'd be more careful. I'm always careful. We'll talk more later. Comrades, I am Vasily Konistov. I bring you greetings from Comrade Stalin. He thanks you for your loyal work. 
But he also desires more work, more sacrifice, especially from you, picked comrades. You are to lead the way to revolution, the Soviet state of America. While I listened, I carefully surveyed the room, the people, until I knew I would remember every detail. Vasily Kornistoy was a big man, 6'1", maybe 2", weighed around 200. Black-haired with eyes that forgot to smile when he did. Those eyes stabbed me, and I knew Kornistoy's memory was at work. When the meeting was over, he kept me for a private talk. Something to drink? No, thanks. Uh, my throat was dry. I have had the feeling all evening that we have met before, Comrade Svetik. Not that I can recall. Well, no matter. I'll remember sometime. I always do. You have a way home? There's a cab stand only a mile from here. It's a nice walk. Very well. Good night, Comrade. Good night. Comrade Matt, over here. Oh, it's you, Comrade Stephanie. Ah, oh, this is my car. Would you ride into town with me? Oh, thanks. You drive. Nice car. Nice girl. Nice night. Quite a combination. I'm glad you like it. No, oh, I didn't say I liked it. I said it was quite a combination. <laughs> You are a heel, aren't you? Then I suppose I have been pretty obvious. You have? Wow. That's some curve. Now, with a drop-off of a hundred feet, if you ever went over that embankment, it would be curtains. You should go slower. So should you. You needn't be rude, Matt. It says that you're the first man in a long time I've been attracted to. Matt. All right, all right, comrade Matt. I know it's heresy for a party member to have feelings. I was hoping you might understand. Now, take it easy, Stephanie. You're tired. You're saying things that could get you into trouble. Yeah, I guess I am tired. May I put my head on your shoulder? Sure. Thanks. Oh, that's a nice feeling. Your shoulder's strong. What I said about the combination, I mean. The car and the night and me. I like it. Do you? Excuse me. Why did you turn off the ignition? Park for a moment. Why? This is why. When I got to my hotel, dawn was breaking. Before I went to sleep, however, I made a call to a certain number and left a message for Ed Grayson to meet me that morning with a wiring crew. Five hours sleep, then I was in a clump of woods near the Little Red schoolhouse listening to Ed give orders to a half dozen men loaded with wiring equipment. All right, men. Frederick's checked the house gas meter. No one's there now, but that doesn't mean they won't come back at any time. So do your work fast and do it good. Now get moving. The mics better be well hidden, Ed. Conestoy is sharp. And suspicious. Yeah, he'd have to tear down the walls to find these. Did he recognize you? Yes, but he can't remember where yet. Hmm. How long is he going to be here? I don't know. Long enough to give us a briefing and our assignments. Yeah, we've got a lot of tape recording. We won't miss a thing that happens. Good. I'll walk down now and grab a taxi and return to the house in the open. That way I'll be there to warn your men if Conestoy or the others show up. Yeah, smart idea. When will the wiring job be finished? Oh, six, five if it goes fast. That's running it pretty close. Meeting starts at 6.30. Yeah, we'll do the best we can. I returned later, and for the next four and a half hours, I played watchdog on the front porch of the Red House. From inside, I could hear the sounds of Grayson's men at work. At 5.42, the FBI men reported their job finished. They were packing up their equipment to leave by the back door when around the curve I saw Conestoy's car approaching. Beat it, you guys. Flash red, flash red. Good 
Well, Comrade Svechik. What are you doing here so early? I, I thought I'd like to talk to you, Comrade Conestoy. Oh? Let's go inside. Oh, wait. What? I mean, it's uh, so nice out here. Why don't we just stay on the porch? I can talk here. Crazy, we could be spotted out here inside. Oh, but Comrade... You'd you... better keep it in mind that I give the orders. Well, I, I guess being inside is not so bad after all. What's the matter with you? You look as if you expected to see something. What is it? I merely wanted to be sure we were alone. I have a report to make about one of our comrades. Oh, is that so? Which one? Comrade Stephanie. She she shows definite signs of bourgeois emotionalism. Oh, I see. Then you had better watch her. Keep me informed. I will. <laughs> you really are a fanatic, aren't you, Comrade Svetik? I believe and follow the party line. Oh, don't mistake me. We need a few good fanatics. Uh, I wish I could remember where I have seen you before. Haunts me as if it's important that I should remember. The next few days were a growing fever of tension for me. The briefing was hard and thorough. I had little time to do anything but study. And this was complicated by constant invitations to study with Comrade Stephanie. And always hanging over my head was the threat of Conestoy's possible remembrance of seeing me with an FBI man. Finally, the last day of the week rolled round. Tonight, comrades, you receive your assignments. You have been well trained. Now you will act on that training. We will organize infiltration of schools? That is correct. You, Comrade Svetik, receive a choice plum. Do you know Bryson University? Yes. Small college not far north of here. Though small Bryson is a highly respected school. An example to many other colleges. You and Comrade Stephanie will see that the seeds of communism are planted there. We will not fail, Comrade Conestoy. I'm sure you won't. Comrade Svetik, about where I have seen you, Perhaps you were around my hotel for some reason? Mm, no. No. Well, don't worry. Maybe by the time you finish your assignment, I will remember. Back to Dana Andrews, starring as Matt Savetic in I Was a Communist for the FBI, and the second act of our story. How long, how long did I have before the Soviet agent, Konestoy, remembered seeing me with an FBI man? The knowledge of what would happen when he did was a cold, leaden ball in my stomach. As with Comrade Stephanie, I listened to Conestoy's final instructions on our new assignment to infiltrate Bryson University. There is one professor at Bryson who will be your best asset, Comrade Svetti. A Professor Walden. Is he a fellow traveler? A very reluctant one. You will have to play down everything except how communism will save the oppressed from the tyranny of fascism. Walden is fond of helping underdogs. Well, uh, can you get us a big name, Comrade Conestoy, someone to lecture the students? I will send a wire tonight to Philip Stanley. The singer? Yes. He has a big reputation. The kids will listen to him even if he is a pinko chump. Will he come? He'll come. He's a thoroughgoing exhibitionist. Now, here is some expense money. Comrade Stephanie? Yes? I'm sending you with Comrade Svetik for only one reason. So you can have the opportunity to get your thinking straight by watching his. Well, I don't... I don't understand you. He is an exemplary party worker. If you are wise, when you come back, you will be too. That's all. Good night. Good night, Comrade Conestoy. Good night, Comrade. Oh, Comrade Svetik. Yes? I just remembered where I saw you. Where? 
At the meeting of the control commission, the first day I arrived back here from the Lenin Institute. Oh, no, I, I wasn't at that meeting. <laughs> oh, I swear I had better remember it soon or it will be the death of me. Bryson University. The usual ivied buildings and rolling green campus littered with students. Professor Walden turned out to be a thin, white-haired man with bent, iron-rimmed spectacles. His office was a six-foot square of stale air wrapped around a battered desk and a stack of papers. Uh, Your coming to see me like this has posed quite a moral problem, Mr. Sovetic. Yes, indeed, uh, quite a problem. You see, I am not sure I am in complete sympathy with communist teachings. Oh, of course, but we're not here to ask you to become a communist, Professor. We merely ask you to work with us in bringing relief to the unfortunates of the world. Oh? Well, in that case, I... What can I do to help? Two things. Give us a list of students you believe to be in sympathy with our cause. And the others? We're going to organize a a lecture. Philip Stanley, the famous singer, is flying all the way out here to address the students. It would be nice if you could act as master of ceremonies and introduce him. Oh, why, of course. I'll be delighted. Philip Stanley, indeed. Professor Walden gave us a list of a dozen names and we went right to work on it. Heading the list was a boy named Roger Vanning. We found him in the Student Union, a hodgepodge of noise and smoke which figures as the social center of any college. Miss Matt, this is like Mardi Gras. We'll never find him in all this mess. Sure we will, but keep moving or you'll be crushed. <laughs> wow! Hey, fellas, get a load of this one. She's real great all the way. Looks like you've made a hit, Stephanie. Ask him if he knows Vanning. All right. Uh, hey, excuse me, but do you know where I can find Roger Vanning? Hey, yeah, Oh. Well, why not take a seat here, Dolly? For you, I'd go on the hook. That'll do, Junior. do tense, Dad. I ain't cruising for bruising. Come on, Stephanie. That Roger Vanning looks like a kid who can vote. You'd better handle him alone. I'll try the next one on our list, uh, Grace Sprocket. Meet you out front later. So you see, Miss Sprocket, it's up to the intelligentsia, like yourself, to lead the others. I understand perfectly, Mr. Sovetic. And I can promise you at least 20 students for the meeting. Good. Philip Stanley will know of your work, I can assure you. He will? I mean, of course, that I'm... Naturally quite pleased to be connected with Mr. Stanley in such a worthy cause. You may tell him he can depend upon Grace Sprocket. Sure, I'll tell him. Four days of work and we had nearly 200 students lined up for our demonstration. I hired a hall near the campus, decorated it with the usual banners and slogans. During last-minute preparations, my mind was on Conestoy. Would he have remembered yet? Perhaps he had, and even now the goon squad was on its way. Ah, oh, me, 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 me. Oh, these are terrible acoustics, Vedic. Perfectly awful. Really shouldn't sing at all in a barn like this. After all, you know, these boys and girls are my public. They deserve to hear me at my best. Oh, absolutely, Mr. Stanley. However, just being able to see you in person and hear your words of truth will inspire these young people to magnificent heights. They'll recognize you as something far greater than a singing star. Greater than a star? Of course. You'll be known as a social leader, a man destined to sway multitudes toward the goal of true socialistic society. Well, I hadn't thought of it that way. Uh, excuse me, Svetik. I think I'll go run over this speech you prepared for me. Mm, better practice it, knucklehead. I hope I can keep my dinner when I hear it. Oh, man. Sure. What is it, Stephanie? Well, I just wanted to check plans with you. Okay. After his song, Stanley will give his talk. At the end, when he starts the Internationale, you give Grace Sprocket and the other agitators the signal to jump up and begin a community sing out of it. And when the crowd's good and excited, Sprocket and company lead them off for a demonstration on faculty row, right? Mm-hmm. And be sure the placards and signs are ready for them to pick up on the way out. Come on, let's get this thing rolling. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen of Bryson, this evening marks the beginning of a new movement here in Bryson. 
A movement that will excite you as it has excited me. Tonight, we are striking a blow against the pressure... So, my beloved friends, here at Bryson, I want to thank you for your wonderful reception of my humble talent and words. In closing this meeting, I can only think of the words of a song dear to my heart and dear to the hearts of all who have compassion for the more unfortunate of this earth. Sing it with me. The words are on the sheets of paper you found in your seats. That's it. The International. Sing it with me. Arise, ye victims of privation. Rise up, all ye who are for law. Sing it, Uncle. Sing it. Sing it loud. Everything went off like clockwork. Excited by the speeches and music, and led by the screaming Grace Sprocket and her cohorts, the thoughtless kids eagerly snatched up the waiting placards and signs to start the demonstration on the campus. For an hour, Stephanie and I watched from the background as the shouting, chanting students paraded on faculty row. Not a very pretty sight, Matt. Are you crazy? It's exactly what we wanted. There'll be a riot for sure. Right. That's why I called him. Come on, Stephanie. Our work here is done. Here we are, Stephanie. Back at the little red schoolhouse. Come on. Conestoy's waiting for us. Let him wait for a minute. I'm sick of it, Matt. I'm sick of the rottenness of the lying and cheating... Let's quit the party, you and I. We could go away together. What? You must be out of your stupid mind talking to me this way. Well, what are you, you going to do? What do you think I'm going to do? I'm going to report you. The party has ways of dealing with treason. Oh, no, no, please don't turn me in that. I'm sorry. It's too late. Get inside. I heard the report on the radio. You did a good job, comrade. What's the trouble? You look angry. I am angry. This traitor just tried to make me quit the party. Oh, did she? <laughs> I told you, Comrade Stephanie. Comrade Stretik is as solid as the Kremlin. He sure is. Wait. Wait a minute. You mean I was just being tested? Testing high-ranking party members is my job, Comrade Stretik. I'm an agent of the MVD. Now, if you excuse me, I'll have to get back to town and file my report. Tested. After all my years in the party. Happens to all of us. Oh, oh, yes. I have something for you. A reward. Here in this drawer. A reward? This. Put up your hands. A gun? What's this all about? I don't understand. FBI agent. That's where I saw you. You were talking to an FBI man. I told you I would remember. Oh, now, now look, I, I can explain that. This fellow just... Get my car, you dirty stool pigeon. Move! What do you plan to do? You mind telling me? <laughs> yes, I will be glad to. I want you to have time to be afraid. We are going to arrange a little suicide. Your suicide. <laughs> My only hope was the FBI surveillance. Conestoy and I were at his car when the FBI men moved in on the run, Ed Grayson leading. Conestoy opened the car door just as Grayson squeezed a shot over our head. Down, Matt, down! I hit the dirt in that precious second when Conestoy's attention was distracted by Grayson. Then Conestoy made his break. Stop! Conestoy, stop! All right, man, get him! FBI fire laced the night with red as it went over me, but Conestoy had a good start. He was getting away when he hit that bad curve, doing 70. Then there was nothing on earth that could save him as his car skidded over the steep embankment. (laughs) 
No use calling an ambulance. Conestoy's dead. Better clear out, fellows, and let the police handle this as an accident. I'll stick around and square it with them. See you later, Grace. It's a tough way to go. Lucky for you, though, Matt. You're free to keep on with your work. Yeah, he was the only one who knew. Well, I'd better get out of here. I think I'll walk up and take a last look at the Little Red Schoolhouse. No, it wasn't the end of a story, nor the beginning. It was just a part of the strange war I was fighting. Freedom's a good cause. It made me feel contented, even though I knew that until the war was won, I'd always be a man who walked alone. Our star, Dana Andrews, will return in a moment. This is Dana Andrews. These stories we bring you are not fiction. They are dramatizations based on actual events and happenings that took place here, in this country, in the real-life experiences of Matt Savetic. For obvious reasons, all names, dates, and localities have been changed. Next week, we'll dramatize another exciting adventure from Matt Savetic's official records. We hope you will join us. Starring Dana Andrews in an exciting tale of danger and espionage, I was a communist for the FBI. From the actual records and authentic experiences, of Matt Sivetic come many of the incidents in this unusual story. Here is our star, Dana Andrews, as Matt Sivetic, who for nine fantastic years lived as a communist for the FBI. When you pose as a communist for the FBI, you're on guard constantly, wondering if the party suspect you, being careful never to make a slip. This is all part of my nine years as a communist for the FBI. <laughs> In a moment, listen to Dana Andrews as Matt Savetic, Undercover Man. Now, here is Dana Andrews as Matt Savetic, Undercover Man. This story from the confidential file is marked Red, Red Herring. When you are an undercover agent for the FBI, you live the life of a spy. You trust no one. Tell nobody what you're really doing, not even your own family. And hanging over you every minute is the threat of exposure, of being found out. You know what that would mean, so you stay on guard. But still... You can't cover everything. Hello? Hello, Mom. This is Matt. Oh, son. How, how are you, son? I'm fine, Mom. Any messages for me? No. But uh, 
there was a man here earlier this evening. A man? One of my... Yes, uh... one of them. One of those. Those... Uh... Commies, you mean? Look. What did he say he wanted? He said something about meeting at the studio tonight. Oh, Matt, when are you going to come to your senses and break away from this terrible organization? And, Mom. And move back home here with the rest of us. And... Mom. We've been over all this before. Oh, but those people are criminals. And none that was here. Cold and hard. Suspicious. Uh, uh, Burkhead, or, or whatever his name was. Burkhead? Burkhart? That's what he did. Burkhart. Are you sure? You sure that was the name? Yes, yes. Matt, you are not in trouble of some kind. Trouble? Oh, of course not, Mom. I gotta go now. I'll be calling you, huh? Goodbye. The studio was a second floor piano school on 9th Street. We used it for secret meetings sometimes in case the regular hall was wired. Two men beside Burkhart were waiting for me. Herb Bemis, chairman of the cell at the time, and Jason Cook, secretary. None of them looked friendly. It's about time. We're trying to find you all evening, Matt. I'm oh, sorry, Herb. I, I didn't get home till late. You have met Comrade Burkhart, Matt. Uh, Comrade Sledek? Yes, about eight months ago in New York. Possibly you don't remember it, Comrade. I remember it. Sit down. Take the chair at the end of the table. Thanks. Sledek, did you say something about not getting home until late? That's right. And uh, Mom gave you the message, so I came straight on down here. Comrade Sledek, are you certain you even went home? What do you mean? Benny Lazzani was waiting for you all evening in a parked car in front of your house, Matt. He just phoned, said you still hadn't showed up. Look, what is this? What difference does it make when I come home? And what's the idea of having Benny spying Sit on down, me anyhow? Come on, Matt I'm sure none of us in the party would mind a little questioning from his leaders unless he had something to hide. Now, what do you mean, something to hide? You know my record in the party? You know the work I've done. Maybe we've only known part of it, Svedek. Comrade Cook, I'll handle this if you don't mind. Svedek, would you mind telling me about your operation at the Conover Manufacturing Company? Conover? What do you mean about planning that agent in the drafting department? That's right. Well, I got him hired through my connections in the U.S. Employment Service. Still working at the plant as a draftsman using the name of Kepler. And what were his instructions, Comrade Svedek? The Conover plant is working on army contracts, control mechanisms for guided missiles. Kepler was to keep his eyes open and pass along any information he could get a hold of. And that's what he's been doing. And has he made contact with any other party members at the plant? No. He was specifically told not to. None of the others even know he's there. Who does know about Kepler? Well, just myself, Comrade Cook, Bemis here. Only the three of you. And all three, of course, are of unquestioned loyalty to the party. I don't get it, Burkhardt. What are you driving at? Just this. Comrade Kepler was arrested by the FBI today. I was caught off base. The three of them sat there watching me, waiting for my reaction. The heat was on. <laughs> Of all the lousy luck. How did it happen? We thought you might know, Comrade Civetti. I wish I did. But I don't see what possibly could have gone wrong. It would almost seem as though the FBI had been tipped off about it. Tipped off? But no one except Bemis and Cook and I even knew. Tipped off by whom? By you, Civetti, you dirty rat. Now, wait a minute. Civetti, the evidence at the moment seems to bear him out. The evidence? What evidence? The evidence of elimination. It seems highly improbable that either Comrade Bemis or Comrade Cook could be a traitor. They've both been in the party for years. All right, but why pick me? You're the only other person who knew Kepler's assignment. Then I'm elected. Is that it? Yes. Unless Kepler has a different idea, that seems to be it. Meanwhile, you'll check in at the Barrett Hotel with Comrade Lazzotti. He'll stay with you until we make a decision. Guarding me? Is that what you mean? Comrade Zvedek? Yes. Lazzotti will be guarding you. Uh, 
Benny Lazati and I checked into the Barrett Hotel a half an hour later. I was on the spot, and I knew it. But I did have one advantage. I realized that Burkhart and the others were only guessing. They had no real evidence of my connection with the FBI. If I could manage to slip them a red herring, some other fall guy, a plan began to take shape. But somehow, I had to contact the FBI, and fast. I got the chance when Benny decided to take a shower and clean up. I waited until he had the water running, then eased the phone off the hook and gave the operator the FBI number. Hello? This is Parker. Ellsworth Parker of Kepler Business. Sorry we couldn't warn you. He got hold of some top secret stuff this afternoon. We had to move in on it. And where are you now? Barrett Hotel, 417. Look, I've got to make contact tonight. All right, where? I'll try to be downstairs in the Barrett Grill in about an hour. Benny Lazati will be with me. I'll be covered. So it'll have to be smooth. Check. Barrett Hotel Grill in an hour. We'll get to you. <laughs> Hey, Benny, what's a three-letter word meaning a small, dirty rodent resembling a rat? How do I know? Three letters like a rat. Hey, maybe it's the FBI. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a good guess. But the second letter is A. Oh, I don't get no place when I try to work them crossword puzzles. Look, Benny, you don't think I'm working for the lousy FBI, do you? It ain't up to me, Matt. All I'm doing is being sure that you stick around until they make up their minds. After that, well, I do what they tell me to. Yeah. Well, we'll find out tomorrow. How's about something to eat, Benny? You got sandwiches or something? No, the grill's open downstairs. Who's buying? I'll buy. Well, as long as it's still in the hotel, I don't see why not. Wait a second. 27 horizontal... Blank term for gullible person who is easily swindled. What is this? Six letters. Oh, forget it, Matt. I don't know nothing about that stuff. Wait. I got it. S-U-C-K-E-R. Sucker. Okay, Benny. Let's go. The crossword puzzle was only a blind. I'd folded a sheet of note paper underneath it. And along with working the puzzle, I'd written some quick instructions to pass along to the FBI. If they were able to make contact, it was all up to them. There was a late supper crowd, and the grill was about half full when Benny and I walked in. We took a booth in the corner, ordered some food, and I looked around the room trying to spot my contact. No luck. Ten minutes passed. And then some little blonde number who had been playing the jukebox apparently decided we looked available. Hiya, boys. Okay if a lady sits down? Hey, sure, baby. Just move right in here by me. Oh, you're too anxious. I'm going to sit over here by Mr. Woman Hater. Uh, Where do you get the woman hater idea? Because you act like it. You're unfriendly. You know, I used to go around with a guy like you. A fellow named Parker. I don't remember his first name. I see. Hey, the music stopped. Anybody got some nickel? Uh, sure, baby. I got some change. Uh, what do you want to hear? Hey, some rumbas. I'm crazy about rumbas. Okay, baby. All right, honey. It's Ellsworth Parker. Are you Sally from the... Dean, Washington office. Transferred out here three days ago. What's up? Plenty. They put this goon on me until they decide whether I'm working for the FBI. Hold still. I'm going to slip a paper into your coat pocket. Yeah. Got it. He'll be back in a minute. Most of the instructions are on that paper. Tell him to use Richards for the frame. Then he knows it. Richards on the frame up. Check. Have him stake the coffee shop from 7 o'clock on. The meeting's called for 8. Right. And good luck. Thanks. I'll need it. Well, Betty. Jason. Where's Benny? And who's this girl you're with? Uh, she ain't with him, Jason. She's with both of us. What are you doing here? I live here, you half wit. Oh, yeah, yeah. I forgot you lived at the barrack. Where were you, Benny? Just playing the jukebox. What's eating you, Jason? Get rid of this girl. Hey, what's coming off here? Hey, up 
that you're a cop, a plain clothesman. I said get out. Well, sure, sure, officer. I don't know these guys. I never saw them before in my life. I just said... Look, you didn't have to do that, Jason. We were just having some fun. You were given an assignment. Get up to your room and stay there, both of you. Yeah, but... Come on, Benny. He's frothing at the mouth already. Why, Cook? What are you so excited about? I'm going to enjoy breaking you, Spedic. You know, that sounds like a personal feeling. With me, the party always comes first. I wonder if you're as loyal as you claim to be. You... Good night, comrade. Come on, Benny. Jason was a rabid Marxist, and along with it, he carried a sullen, sadistic hatred toward the whole world. Even the other party members detested him. That's what I was counting on, because I'd pick Jason Cook for my fall guy. Back to Dana Andrews, starring as Matt Savetic in I Was a Communist for the FBI, and the second act of our story. Jason rode up on the elevator with us and then went on up to his own room a few floors above. Then he and I turned in. I lay there for a while, thinking, as I had many times before, that these things weren't happening in Europe or Asia. This was the USA, my own country. I'd grown up in it and never realized until I started working undercover for the FBI. Communist plotters, spies, secret police, the whole rotten authoritarian system right here in America. I'd never known it. It was just before daylight when the knock came at the door of our room. What's the matter? Hey, was that you, Matt? No, somebody at the door, Benny. I'll get it. Who do you suppose could be knocking at the door this time? Good morning, Comrade Vedic. Burkhart. Mind if I come in? Would it make any difference if I did? Not in the least. However, you are hardly showing the attitude of a loyal party member. I'm sorry, Comrade. I want to get to the bottom of this just as much as you do. I imagine so. Take the chair there beneath the lamp. Well, Comrade Lazzati, I suggest you go back to sleep. Stay in bed. This doesn't concern you. Uh, yes, sir. Anything you say. Now, let's review the facts in this matter again. Now? This time of the morning? There is no one as truthful as a drowsy witness, Comrade Vedic. We often prove that principle at the Lenin Institute. Hmm. Suppose we turn the lamp so. It's right in my eyes. Yes, another little technique of the Institute. We've just lost a very valuable agent. And we seem to have a traitor in our midst. An FBI informer. I'm sure it's the desire of both of us, Comrade Svetik, to discover that tool of the enemy and to eradicate him. Lean back, Comrade. Relax. Look at the light. There's nothing to worry about. The questioning went on for an hour and a half. Burkhardt was clever. He reworded phrases and used quick questions. But when he finally turned off the light and left, I was fairly certain I hadn't fumbled anything. Not that I was any closer to being in the clear, of course. That would depend on what happened in the coffee shop between 7.30 and 8 in the evening. Well, it's 7.20. I guess we got plenty of time to eat and get over to the meeting by 8 o'clock. Oh, sure. Plenty of time, Benny. It's all right? Yeah, yeah, it's okay. Oh, man, I'm so hungry I could eat a three-pound sirloin. Easy, comrade. That's capitalist food. Yeah? We'll just wait till we take over and see what we give them to eat. No share and share alike, Benny? Not for them crumb buns. We'll be the big shots, then. All us guys have done the dirty work. What about the old brotherhood of man? Oh, that's for the birds, Matt. We'll be the guys with the big cars and the dames. And anybody that don't like it knows what they can do. You know something, Benny? You and I think exactly alike. (laughs) 
I went on eating and talking to Benny, but I kept my eyes on my top coat, hanging on the wall by the cashier's desk. At 7.35, a small, unobtrusive man a few tables away finished his meal and went up to pay his check. He fished through his pockets for change and casually brushed against my coat. No one else noticed, but I did. The FBI had made a plan. I knew a sealed envelope had been slipped into the pocket of my coat. The first half of my instructions had been carried out. So far, so good. But the second half of the plan kept hanging fire. I knew Jason Cook's habits. I figured him to leave the hotel by 7.40. But at 7.45, he still hadn't come out. And I began to sweat. Then, at ten minutes to late, I saw him leave the main entrance and start along the sidewalk outside the window by our table. Hey, look, Matt. There's Jason leaving the hotel. Where? Oh, yeah. Must be on his way to the meeting. Oh, looks like he's running into a friend. Yeah, he's stopping to talk to somebody else. No, no, I guess not. Guy must have just wanted a light. Jason's giving him some matches. Yeah, I guess that is it. The fellow's doing a lot of talking, though. Well, might be somebody that lives here at the... Matt. What's the matter, Benny? I know that guy. Oh? He questioned me once. His name's Richards. He's an FBI agent. Oh, you must be mistaken, Benny. Look, he's shaking hands with Jason, patting him on the back. I'm not mistaken. His name's Richards, and he's FBI. How come he's so friendly with Jason? I don't know. But I'm beginning to wonder. Why? What's the wonder about Jason's the guy they're looking for? He's the stool pigeon. Oh, there must be some that other explanation. That match business was nothing but a cover-up. I'll bet he handed a report or something to Richards right then. Yeah. Or took something from it. That's it. A payoff. That's what it was. Look, Matt, will you back me up? Sure, Benny. I'll back you up. It was 8 o'clock when Benny and I climbed the stairs to the meeting hall. Jason, Burkhardt, and Bemis were already inside. As we took off our top coats in the ante room, I managed to slip my planted envelope into the pocket of Jason's coat. And we went on inside. No late, Fedick. What's the matter? Afraid to face the music? I've got nothing to be afraid of, Jason. As I told Comrade Burkhardt this morning when he interrogated me. Hardly an interrogation, Comrade Fedick. Rather a mutual attempt to arrive at the facts. All right, a, a mutual attempt, then. Well, uh, is the verdict in? Matt, our lawyer got in to see Comrade Kepler today. Yeah, what happened, Bemis? Kepler says there was no reason for him being picked up except on a tip-off. I see. And he picks you for the number one probability. Why? On what basis? Basis? You're the only one it could have been. What more basis does anybody need? And apparently in the face of nothing more than a wild guess. All the work I've done for the party doesn't mean a thing. It's a matter of total security, the good of the cause itself. Don't you agree with that principle, Comrade Bettick? Yes, of course I agree, but now, I... wait a second, everybody. I got a question here of my own I want to ask. Benny, you're only here on an assignment. Nobody's interested in your question. Well, I think they might be if they heard it. Comrade Lozani. Jason, who was that guy you met out in front of the hotel a few minutes ago? The one that shook hands with you and patted you on the back. I don't know who he was. He wanted to borrow a match. What difference does it make? It might make quite a lot, Jason. Benny says he knows the guy. Well, what of it? Plenty. The guy's name is Richard. He's an FBI agent. Well, are you certain of that? Sure I am. He picked me up once. You don't think I'd forget him, do you? I tell you, the man asked me for a match, commented on the weather. I don't know why he shook hands. I didn't know he was an FBI. He gave you something, too, Jason. What was it? Nothing. That's a lie. You can search me if you want. I think that's an excellent suggestion. If you don't mind, Mike. They're lying, both of them. I only know what I saw, Jason. I didn't think anything of myself until Benny recognized the man. It doesn't seem to be anything incriminating. Unless... Didn't you wear a top coat this evening, Comrade Cook? I sure he did. He had it on when he was talking to the guy. Where'd you hide it, Jason? What'd you do with it? It's in the ante room, you fool. What did you think I'd do with it? Would you bring the coat, Comrade Bemis? Yes, of course. This is ridiculous. Why, everybody knows... Sit down, I... Comrade Cook. As I think back over it, I recall you as being the one most energetic in pressing the suspicion against Comrade Fetty. I find that somewhat interesting. Uh, sure. He was just trying to cover up for his own game. Here's the coat, Comrade Burkhardt. Ah, yes. Nothing in this pocket. I told you there wasn't. Just a moment. Hmm. That's not mine. 
I never saw that envelope before. Sealed. No address. No, it's a frame-up. Somebody planted that on me. Hey, money. Yes, $500. Is that the price you got for Kepler, comrade? It's a lie. I don't understand it. We, we've got to get to the bottom of this and find Be out... Be quiet. How much, Fiddick? Seems we owe you an apology. Well, that's all right, comrade. I'm just glad we found out the truth. And happy that I can go on serving the party as I have in the past. That movie made me hungry, man. Go for a sandwich? The grill's still open. No, I think I'll grab a text and go home, Benny. I wonder what they'll do to Jason. Oh, run him out of town. Beat him up a little, maybe. <laughs> I wish they'd give me that job. When you think about him being the one who was always trying to push everybody else around, and all the time he was stooling for the FBI. You never know, Benny. You just never know. Hey, Matt, it's a body. Yeah. Somebody jumped out of the hotel. Yeah. I wonder if that... Come on, Benny. Pardon me. Pardon me, please. Hmm. Matt, it's, it's... Yeah, let's get out of here. Matt, it's Jason. It was. He couldn't take it. Couldn't face the disgrace. He committed suicide. Maybe. I didn't know whether Jason Cook had fallen, jumped, or whatever. I still don't know, for sure. But I do know that Burkhart left town early the next morning. As Bemis put it, his work here was finished. I left Benny and walked along the street alone. I felt sick all over. Maybe Jason deserved it, but I hadn't planned to put him on that kind of a spot. I tried to push it out of my mind. An undercover agent can't afford feelings any more than he can afford friends or a family. And the one main objective was still safe. I was still on the job. Still a communist for the FBI. I still walked alone. Dana Andrews will return in a moment. This is Dana Andrews with a word about the story you've just heard. In this story, as in all others, names, dates, and places are fictitious to protect innocent persons. Many of these stories are based on incidents in the life of Matt Savetic, who worked undercover for the FBI. Next week, another fantastic adventure. Join us, won't you? I was a communist for the FBI. Starring Dana Andrews in an exciting tale of danger and espionage, I was a communist for the FBI. You are about to hear a strange story. Names, dates, and places are for obvious reasons fictional. But many of the incidents are based on the authentic experiences of Matt Savetic, who for nine fantastic years lived as a communist for the FBI. Yes, for nine years I posed as a communist for the FBI. I was one of them, lived with them, 
did their dirty work. It was a strange life, being friends with people I hated and being hated by people I would have liked to have had as my friends. For nine years, a communist for the FBI. This is a story of my work and why it had to be done. In a moment, listen to Dana Andrews as Matt Sabatik, Undercover Man. Dana Andrews as Matt Sabetic, Undercover Man. This story from the confidential file is marked Traders for Hire. The commies wanted a man in the United States Employment Service, and they wanted it bad. My job? To find out why. So temporarily, I found myself nine to fiving it as an employment counselor. It was pretty dull until I got a call to visit a certain sporting goods store. Yes, sir. I'll show you our new ship and a fishing tackle. A spinning reel, perhaps. The winter is the time to catch red trout. How many times do red trout bite on flies? Seven in the morning, four at noon. And seven at night. Step in the back room, please. Hello, man. What's up, Morgan? Your message sounded urgent. It is. When the FBI helped you swing that new job with the U.S. Employment Service, we apparently did you a bad turn. Why? The party seemed tickled, if you'll pardon the pun, pink. Oh, the party wants a man in that spot, no doubt, but your quick promotion made some comrades suspicious. We got a report from our agent in New York. The entire communist record's being checked by Red Secret Police. Oh, that's just swell. It's worse. You're slated to be called up before a Communist Control Commission investigation. When? When the MVD agents have finished checking you. How about the application cards of the communists I've placed? I'd better get them back in the file. No can do. You get them back only after we've made photostats of them. And any new ones must continue to be sent to us. If the Reds don't check your office, you'll be okay. But if they do... I know. Please omit the flowers. <laughs> United States Employment Service, Mr. Savetic's office. Uh, yes, sir. Notification has been made. Goodbye. Uh, yes, sir, can I... Uh, just a moment, sir. Have you an appointment? Child, do not be a fool. I need no appointment. Ah, good morning, Monsieur Savetic. Good morning. I am Pierre Le Monsieur. <laughs> You uh, will place me as head barber at the Victoria Aircraft Plant. They have a shop for the executives, I understand. Well, yes, but head barber. No, I'm sorry, but I... I, I want to begin work on Monday. You're a dreamer, Mr. Levasseur. The position at Victoria is not open. It will be. It will be. It seems that a few minutes ago there was a tragic accident. A man was injured. A head barber? Yes. The poor man was struck by a company vehicle while returning from the plant commissary. You'd better give me a fast reason why I shouldn't call the cops. Mm. But certainly. It will suffice if I introduce myself properly. Comrade Svetti. You have identification? Of course, but not on my person, obviously. You'll be shown them at a special meeting tonight, comrade. What meeting? I'm taking over this territory, comrade. You will find my methods different and I am sure much more efficient. For example, a party inspector will check your office and files to make certain of your efficiency. Inspector? Who? When? He'll introduce himself at the proper time. If you are wise, you'll be ready for his inspection at uh, any moment. And now, about the job for uh, Pierre... Thank you, monsieur. You have been most kind. Bonjour. Goodbye. Betty, Mr. Levasseur is to be placed in the executive barbershop at Victoria, starting as a Monday. 
draw up five copies and have them on my desk for signature this evening. You're really going to place that... Yes, Mr. Savetic. I'm going out for a while to my dentist. Is, uh, is there a number where I can reach you? No, no number. <laughs> Mr. Burns. Yes, Mr. Svetik. Is something wrong, Mr. Svetik? You're in charge of this outer office, Mr. Burns. It would be nice if you could see that it's more like an office and less like a quilting bee. Yes, sir. I- I'll put out a memo right away. You put out too many memos. Tell them. They can discuss their social lives somewhere else, but at work. And, uh... Put out that pipe. Oh, yes, Mr. Swedick. Not in the way paper basket, you idiot. Oh, you want to set the place on fire? All right, what are you all gaping at? Get to work. Matt, are you sure about this? Of course I'm sure. If that barber dies, Lavasseur is a murderer. We'll get to work on the barber's case and advise the local authorities when and if they can move in. If you nail Lavasseur, let me know. I'll help with the embalming. You better keep your mind on your own problem. Whoever the comrade is that has a knife out for you, he's close. How close? Right next to you, according to our last report. Someone in your office, probably. Uh, They don't miss any bets. Look, uh, we'll continue to use this shop for meeting when you can get away and think it's safe. Otherwise, we'll use a car pickup. And you'll have a new phone number to call. What is it? Number will be Brighton 91950. My name will be Worcester. Harry Worcester. Identification? Golf score. Use a low score for all's well, a high score for urgency or danger. Got it? Yeah. Except for one thing. I've never played golf. How the devil do you score it? I left the FBI man, Morgan, and returned to the office to find things running normally. The girls were busy chattering about last Saturday night's failure and next Saturday night's hope. Except one named Carol, who was batting her blue eyes at Wally Burns until the nervous little office manager was ready to jump right out of his chair. Waiting in my private office was a 200-pound man with a one-ounce brain. Well, I, Comrade Svedek... I need a new job on account I get... Get out of my chair. Hmm? Oh, sure, comrade. Only thought... You never thought in your life, Sargo. You've been fired from eight jobs already because you can't keep quiet about being a party member. Only I didn't get fired this time because I'm a party member. I was fired because I carried out the orders of our new leader. Your leader. What are you talking about? I was kicked out of Victoria because I had an accident. They said I was careless. (laughs) If only they don't know how careless. So you drove the truck that hit the barber. That's right. An instruction from Comrade Levasseur, and that ain't all. He wants me to get together a police unit firm. I see. Levasseur is here representing the party's control commission. And you're going to head his private goon squad. Well, you fit, Sargo. Yes, Mr. Svedic. Get me the personnel manager, Mr. Lewis, at the Marshall plant. Yes, sir. <laughs> A few minutes of talk, and I had Comrade Sargo placed again, this time in the Marshall plant. The rest of the day, I spent examining my office force, wondering which one was the commie spy. Betty, my impulsive but efficient secretary? Wally Burns, maybe. Or was it Carol? Or some other typist? Whoever it was, I had to find out soon. When I got off at 5.30, I was picked up by Comrade Sargo. He took me to the special meeting in a shabby hotel room, giving me no chance to contact the FBI as to its whereabouts. Here he is, Comrade Levasseur. Bonsoir, Comrade Seretti. Hello, Comrade Levasseur. Where are the others? Others? There are no others. This is a special meeting for the three of us. I prefer that what we discuss remains with us. That way, any leak can be quickly traced. To one of us, I understand. Hmm. Then to business. I am bringing in hundreds of loyal communist workers from all over the country. You will see that they are placed in vital positions, hmm? I want them in every plant. That's quite an order. You must do it, Comrade Seretic. With our men in key positions, we can disrupt the war production of this area at will. <laughs> Hello? 
Hello, Harry Wooster? Speaking. My golf game's lousy, Harry. Shot 115. Everything's clear, Matt. Go ahead. It's big, Morgan. Lavasser is planning on flooding the war plants in this area with commies from all over the country. What? That's great, Matt. Go ahead and place them. We can pick them up at the first sign of trouble, before they can sabotage so much as a bolt. All right. But I'll have to stop sending in the application cards. For this big a plan on, the party's bound to send an agent to inspect my file sometime. Sorry, Matt. Right now we need those cards more than ever. But, Morgan, if the party spy in my office checks my file, I'll be caught... Here's a locked file. Keep the only key. That'll stop him. But not a Soviet secret police investigator. I'm sorry, Matt. I'm afraid that's a chance you're just going to have to take. Back to Dana Andrews, starring in I Was a Communist for the FBI, and the second act of our story. One hundred and forty-six communists I placed in the war plants, and still they kept coming. My locked file at the office became more and more of a threat with its empty sections, sections that were in FBI hands. Always over my head hung the fear of the surprise inspection by a Soviet agent. And to make life just that much worse, I had the knowledge of a communist spy being in my office staff. A spy that had me facing an inevitable trial by the Control Commission, the party's equivalent of a Gestapo. Yes, Mr. Sargo, may I help you? Well, I don't know, baby. Try and see. Mr. Svetik is out at the moment. Will you wait? Well, sure. For you, it might be fun, honey. The name is Miss Ward to you. Oh, is it? Well, me, I got just a remedy for a snooty little doll like you. A little kiss. Let go of me, you big ape. Let go. I'll see you pay. Hey, my arm. Milk-faced little fascist. I'll teach you some respect for the party. I go. Let her go. No, not until I teach you something. Oh, you filthy communist knucklehead. I said let go. Uh, what? Why, you... What? Wait, no, wait, no. Don't, don't hit me again. I'll show you to manhandle a decent girl, you sick kid. Come, come it. Uh, Slime. Uh. You're not out, you dirty red. Get up and get out of here. Take your smelly communist ideas of decency with you. Get out. All right. All right, I'm going. Just give me a chance. Go on, get off. Good heavens. What was all that about, Mr. Svetik? Nothing. Get back to work, all of you. Quick. Why, of course, Mr. Svetik. I'm sorry, Mr. Svetik, but the noise and all, I can... Oh, gee, thanks, Mr. Svetik. I hope this fight won't get you into any trouble. Sargo had that one coming, Betty. He sure did. Funny. You know, for a long time, I thought you might be a communist. It was a bad mistake. I knew the spy had heard me spouting off. And I knew it was coming. It came at four in the morning when I was asleep in my hotel room. Yeah, yeah. So I owe you money. I'm coming. Good morning, Mr. Svetik. What? What do you want, Sargo? Who are those guys with you? Don't act so scared, tough man. We just come to invite you to party. At four in the morning? Go back to the store and sleep it off. Get your pants on, Comrade. The party wants to ask you a few questions. Now. Here he is, Comrade Lover, sir. Bright and shiny. Did you search him? We did better. We watched him dress. The Control Commission has been checking your record, Comrade Svetik. We've been quite thorough. Yes, and? Unfortunately for you, the record shows only the best service to the party. Well, and what's the idea of bringing me... A clear record does not mean you are free of suspicion. Your promotion to counselor in the U.S. Employment Service. Uh, Did you manage it so easily? Who got it for you? 
I worked for it. Perhaps the FBI helped a little? I've told you, I have no connection with the FBI. But you have changed. You lost your faith in the party. No. But you did attack a comrade today. Well, yes, but And during this attack you said things. May I speak? (laughs) By all means, comrade. First of all, I'm surprised that you would listen to an idiot like Comrade Sargo. What are you doing? Do I understand by this that you deny his accusation? If he says I have in any way been disloyal to the party, yes. Ah. You've made the mistake I was waiting for, Comrade Svetik. It was not only Comrade Sargo's word, another comrade testified to your comments. Open the door. Yeah, comrade. Huh. Well, Comrade Svetik? Burns, Wally Burns. Yes, yes, it's me, you rotten spy, me, Wally Burns. I knew you were a traitor when they put you in as counselor. That was my job you stole. Enough, Comrade Burns. Well, Comrade Svetik, do you still persist in your lies? I repeat, I have never been disloyal to the party. Explain. My proof lies in common sense, Comrade Lavasseur. If I'd done anything else except throw Sargo out of my office and make a big pretense of hating communism, how long do you think I'd have kept my job? Mm Mm-hmm. As you say, Comrade Svetik, common sense. Oh, now, now, just a moment. You're not going to swallow that, that hogwash. That hogwash, Comrade Burns, makes a great deal of logic. If I were you, I would examine my own loyalty to the party. My loyalty? That the jealousy over a fascist job is a grave weakness. No, As I... for you, Comrade Sargo, your stupid behavior jeopardized months of work. I'm recommending you to be transferred to another district for proper disciplinary action. No, no, please That's don't... That's all, comrades. Good night. Just a moment, Comrade Levasseur. If I'm cleared, I want to request that Comrade Burns leave my office at once. I prefer he stay. He's the logical choice for your position, in case anything should happen to you. When Lavasseur smiled that sly, wet smile at me, I knew I had only partially won. He was reserving judgment and waiting, waiting for me to be overconfident enough to make that one slip. I had an idea, so I called my FBI contact, and in half an hour, a sleepy Morgan picked me up in his car. As we rode around the dark streets, we talked. Matt, you know I want to pin that barber's accident on Sargo and Lavasseur, but Sargo looks... Believe me, Morgan, he's ready to crack wide open. I know he looks tough, but he showed a yellow streak a yard wide in our fight. And now that he's in bad trouble with the party, he's ripe. All right, we'll pick him up. Do it now, while he's off balance. Throw a scare into him about having a witness. And when he starts talking... He'll talk himself into prison and lava sewer with him. Okay, Matt. Is that all? All? What do you want from one night's work, Stalin? I didn't get much sleep, but I felt good going to work the next morning. For I was sure Sargo would sing. And loud. I could even stand the sight of Wally Burns back in his role as the nervous little office manager who always forgot and knocked his pipe out in wastebasket. He had reason to be nervous that morning. And so did I, only I didn't realize it until I was in my private office and found Pierre Levasseur waiting for me. Good morning, Comrade Serretti. Something wrong at your plant? No. You uh, intrigued me last night, Comrade. That is why I decided to look at your record this morning instead of waiting to have a regular inspector come in. Well, well, the file's locked. The key is... I seem to have misplaced it. I hope you find it. I'm going to see those files. Well, yes, naturally. Oh, here's the key. The uh, file's in the other room. I'll go open it and bring you the... I'll go with you, comrade. You may need help. This was the payoff. One glance through that file and Lavasseur would know I was an FBI agent. I led the way to the outer office, trying desperately to think of some way out. Seeing Wally Burns gave me one faint hope. 
As I remembered his habit of knocking out his pipe in wastebaskets, it was a thin chance. But as I passed the wastebasket, I palmed my lighter, snapped it into a flame, and dropped it unnoticed into the pile of crumpled papers. The file is over here, Mr. Levasseur. Open it, quickly. Good. Let's take it into your private office. Fire! Just dispatch it! Fire! 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 Samantha, give me that fire! The burning wastebasket made a lot of smoke, and the excited clerks helped the confusion, but Pierre Levasseur was not to be distracted. He yanked the file drawer from me and headed for the outer door. I knew if he reached it, I was finished. So with my right foot, I hooked his ankle going by, causing him to fall headlong against a desk in a snowstorm of open files and papers. Levasseur! Oh, Mr. Levasseur, let me help. I'll take care of him, Burns. Get those girls and the others out of here. But, Mr. Spreddick, he's unconscious. I said get these people out of here. Yes, sir. All right, outside, everyone. Outside, I said. Move outside. Clear the room. Once the room was empty of people, I went to work fast, seeing to it that the wastebasket fire destroyed enough of my file cards and papers to make Pierre's investigation useless. Then a few minutes with a fire extinguisher, and the fire was a wet and smoldering mass of papers. Then I dragged the limp Pierre Levasseur out to the sidewalk in fresh air. It took a while to clear away the crowds and assure everyone things were all right. But by the time Pierre was recovering, he and I and Wally Burns were alone, while inside the office staff was starting to clean up the debris. Oh. Take it easy, comrade. You had a bad fall in there. What happened? There was a fire. And... You were running with a file and tripped over a phone cord. I tried to catch you, but I missed. I see. Ah, it's too bad. I suppose it cannot be helped now. Only, how did such a fire start? Ask Wally Burns. Me? Why, I had nothing to he do. He has the habit of knocking his pipe coals into a wastebasket. It would seem he did it once too often. Is that true, Comrade Burns? Well, yes, that is, I, I did forget once or twice, but I swear I didn't do it today. You've got to listen to That's me. That's enough. I... I've listened to you too often. You'll pay for your bungling, Comrade. The party will see to that. No. No, you won't get me in that cellar. I... I'll quit first. I'll go away. You won't find me. Not me. You're not going to find me. <laughs> Fool will find you, Comrade Burns. Well, we want you. Help me up, sir, I think. All right, sure. Merci. This time I am going... You are not going anywhere, mister, except to jail. Jail? Where are you? What are you talking about? Lieutenant you... Daniels, homicide. You are Pierre Levasseur. Mais oui, Bob. No but... buts, just come along. Cuff him, Frank. You hired the wrong boy, my red friend. Sargo told us the whole thing. Hey, now, wait, Lieutenant. Stay out of it, fella. Take it on this punk who reads assault and battery with intent to commit murder. Come on, Kami. You got a date with a new cell, the prison kind. I'm sorry, Mr. Levasseur. It looks like I can't help you now. They went off, friend and enemy, and I started for my office. No, my job wasn't ended. This was just another part. A part of my undercover war against communism. As long as communists tried to murder freedom, I would be in battle... A strange battle and a stranger battlefield, across which I knew I would always be walking alone. Our star, Dana Andrews, will return in a moment. This is Dana Andrews. All over America, people like Matt Savetic are fighting to win over the forces of communism in our country. It's a never-ending fight. 
One that concerns you and me and all loyal Americans who love this country and hate the subversive forces that threaten to destroy our American way of life. Next week, we bring you another strange and fantastic story based on the true life experiences of Matt Svetik. Plan to be with us at that time, won't you? communist for the FBI. Starring Dana Andrews in an exciting tale of danger and espionage, I was a communist for the FBI. Many of the incidents in the story you are about to hear are based on the actual records and authentic experiences of Matt Sevetic, who for nine fantastic years lived as a communist for the FBI. Here is our star, Dana Andrews, as Matt Sevetic. Nine years. Nine nervous years. Always looking over my shoulder. Because if I didn't, my head might roll when I didn't want it to. Years of isolation and tension. Being alone in crowds of comrades. A long, hectic dream. But now that it's over, the dream is more real than ever. For all of us now. In a moment, listen to Dana Andrews as Matt Sabetic, Undercover Man. Dana Andrews as Matt Sabetic, Undercover Man. This story from the confidential file is marked Card Game in the Clouds. The federal courtroom is jammed. There's no stir and no sound in the room except the voice of the attorney for the federal government making his opening to the court. Everybody in the room knows that this matters. This is important. This is part of an enormous struggle for our survival. We listen spellbound. And we shall present witnesses whose testimony will prove beyond any shadow of a reasonable doubt that these defendants, all members of the Communist Party, have been guilty of sedition, seeking the overthrow of the United States government by force and by force of arms if need be. We are ready to proceed, Your Honor. Are you ready to leave, Mr. Zvedek? Well, who, who are you? Come with me. Give me one good reason and maybe I will. Revchenko wants you. Oh, Revchenko? Not so loud. Headquarters? Certainly not. I'm to telephone Revchenko that I found you. He'll pick us up at a spot that I'll designate. You must be quite a gal with the party. I am. We'd better go. Revchenko is an impatient man. <laughs> Comrade Sovetic, you know that we wish to know at all times where our comrades are and what they're doing. You seem to know where I was, Comrade Rochenko. Only because you were seen in the courtroom by a comrade. I've been looking all morning for you. Ah, so the lady tells me. The lady is Comrade Laura Black. Comrade? Comrade. Well, I'm ready for orders. When we reach the city limits, this automobile may have been wired by the FBI. We will abandon it to talk. Interesting problem, comrade. When we leave the car, comrade. Here, this will do. I'm about tired of walking in fields. Well, comrade, 
Comrade Laura, I'm out of breath. Begin for me, if you will, and be direct. Comrade Zvetik, you and I will meet a plane at Municipal Airport tonight. The plane is from Washington, D.C. Oh, oh. I will meet a man coming off the plane. What about me? You will stay in the background. The man will give me a portfolio, which we will deliver to a comrade in New York City. The Park Lowell Hotel. You will take the night train. Does it take two? If one of you is detained, shall we say, the other must get through with the briefcase at all costs. Should I know the contents of the briefcase? No. Simply follow orders and to the letter. And the letter is? Exactly. You are to report to a Mr. Penrose at the Park Lowell Hotel tomorrow night. No later. Mr. Penrose has made elaborate and delicate plans for leaving the country Friday night. With the briefcase? Of course. Suppose Laura and I become separated and she has the briefcase. Do I report to Mr. Penrose anyhow? Yes. Empty-handed? Yes. Okay. A good stroke, huh, comrade? Our executing this audacious move during the communist trials when the FBI expects us all to scurry into hiding. Oh, yeah. It's a good time for us to move. You have a revolver, Savetic? Yes. Take it with you. Take all orders from Comrade Laura. Is that all? See to it that one of you succeeds in getting the information in that briefcase to New York. That is all. Mr. Oxford, please. Who's calling, Mr. Oxford? Cambridge. This is Oxford. Go ahead. The boys dragged me out of the federal courthouse this morning for an assignment with all the romantic gingerbread. Mysterious gal, briefcase by plane from Washington, D.C. Gun told Hold it. Hold it. Yeah? Where did you say you're calling from? Pay station, drugstore, 12th and Main. Fool with a sandwich there, and I'll pick you up in exactly ten minutes. Sound big to you, too, Oxford? Ten minutes. The FBI has been waiting for this chance for a long time, Matt. This looks like it. It felt important the second that gal tagged me. Vital information leaks have been occurring in Washington a lot too frequently. We've wanted to know how the commies do it. This looks like a look-in on one of their methods. This could be my big moment. It's peculiar. Why do they want you to report to this Mr. Penrose Friday night, even if you don't have the briefcase with you? For discipline, I suppose. That's what worries me. Matt, we want you to deliver that briefcase. And <laughs> Believe me, I want to deliver it, too. If only as a personal health measure. Keep in touch all the way, Matt. Uh, stay with me, boy, huh? We will. We'll be with you at the train. Sort of. I pick up Laura at 6. We drive to the airport and wait for flight 695 from Washington, D.C. to taxi to gate 5. A tall man in a flapping top coat and dark glasses steps out of the plane. He's carrying a briefcase. I crowd the wire fence for a good look, but the girl pushes ahead of me and faces me. Her eyes are cold toward me, but I sense an inner excitement in her manner that I'm not the guy that's exciting her. Please go inside and wait for me. Why can't I meet the gentleman from across the Potomac? Do as I say, please. You're pretty set on my not seeing your boy up close. And you're set on seeing him close. Why? Just being a good party member is all. More like one of those contemptible FBI plants who are going to testify at the trial. How does that figure? Now, that's a rough remark, Laura. Then please don't intrude until you're needed. Now go. Yes, Sergeant. I go inside and wait, doing a slow burn and starting to worry a little. Five minutes later, another plane is announced departing for Washington, and Laura comes into the waiting room with the briefcase. She also has a smudge of lipstick on her cheek. Thank you for waiting. Where's the watch on the Potomac? He's on the way back to Washington. I, uh, I'd be glad to carry your school books for you. Thank you, but I'll carry the briefcase. Wait here. 
Again? I'll pick up our plane reservations. I thought you said we were taking the train. We were. Now we're not. That can be confusing. I mean it to be confusing. Well, you made it, sister. No objections? I don't like to be treated like the bourgeois rich relative while I'm an accredited and trusted member of the party. Unless maybe you don't trust me. I don't know, do you? Do you trust me? Let's say I trust comrade Laura Black. But plain Laura Black, who isn't plain at all and with a smudge of lipstick on her cheek, may be something else again. Warren and I happen to be in love. Oh, Warren, is it? And you'll forget it, do you hear? The tender passion and the party. Is hmm. it quite all right with you? The question is, is it all right with the party? The answer is that if we weren't in love, he wouldn't be doing this for me and the party. Flight 802 for Buffalo is now loading at gate 7. Well, I'd better hurry and pick up our reservations. No hurry. That's 802 for Buffalo. Yes, that's for us. We're going to New York. By way of Buffalo. Why? You'll see. Passengers for flight 802 for Buffalo, please board your plane at... You wait here. I'll get the tickets. I look around for a telephone booth. I've got to let the FBI know that I'm flying to Buffalo tonight instead of training out to New York. All the phone booths are filled and people are waiting except at one where a soldier is talking and smiling in pantomime behind the glass door. Come on, soldier, I'm next. Ring off, hang up. Because if that briefcase that Laura Black carries under her arm gets to Moscow, it may wipe that smile off your face for good and for a lot of other guys like you. He keeps on talking. There's the telegraph counter. I go to the counter and scrawl a message and hand it to the clerk, just as Laura Black's hand reaches past me and takes the yellow blank out of my hand. May I, Max? You may not. Oh, private? And personal, and you're getting pretty personal with my privacy. There's no such things in our lives, is there? Go ahead, read it. Mrs. Vettick. My mother. Who is Mr. Oxford? A prospect of mine. What kind of prospect? Insurance. I sell insurance as a front as well as a livelihood. I've got to live while I'm serving the party. You tell your mother to phone this Mr. Oxford at Crest 2211 and tell him you're flying to Buffalo tonight. Right. Why? Mother expected Mr. Oxford and me for dinner tonight before I took the train. I want him to know my plans have changed and we can't dine together tonight. Crest 2211. That's right. Why not telephone him? The booths are full. No, they aren't. They were a minute ago. Better still, let me telephone him. What for? Well, you think I'm your secretary. It does make an impression. Oh, no, not with smaller investors. They, they feel somehow it runs up the cost to them. Oh, I'll know how to talk to Mr. Oxford. You wait here. No, Laura, no. Wait there. Oh, no. I'll wait if it kills me. And if Laura makes that call and they tell her there's no such person there... I wait, I've got to. I've got nothing to lose but everything. Back to Dana Andrews, starring in I Was a Communist for the FBI, and the second act of our story. Laura Black goes to the telephone booth and stops there, fumbling for a coin. I shove the telegraph blank at the clerk again and hand her two dollars and start after Laura. If she phones Crest 2211, the unlisted FBI number... There won't be a Mr. Oxford there, not for her. If Laura Black calls and doesn't get Oxford, she'll be more suspicious than ever. I'll be in trouble then. I reach her side just as she finds a coin in her purse. I thought I told you to wait for me. Well, I, I saw you needed some change. I but... have it now, thank you. Excuse me. Well, Laura, I... Look... This is the last call for wait. passengers for flight 802 to Buffalo. Now ready to Oh, depart. dear. Oh, never mind. It's all right. Oxford will understand. Well, we'd better hurry. We mustn't miss connections with our man in Buffalo. Come on. In the plane, 
Jane, Laura and I play canasta with cards furnished by the stewardess. The briefcase on her lap serves as a table. On her lap. Somehow, I've never even touched the leather portfolio. So far, I'm excess baggage on this assignment, and I don't like it. We play indifferently at first, idly. Then, as the coveted stack of cards on the briefcase grows larger, the play grows tense and watchful. Strangely, some enormous stakes seem in the balance. Our playing is careful and charged. Hmm. Stuck? All out of wild cards? Well, I may have a throwaway or two left. Sure. Fatten a pile for me to take. You don't want to pile, do you? You're ready to go out. Okay, I'm ready to go out. Agreeable monster, aren't you? Play. I just can't help it. i got to give you the deck. There. Hmm. I don't know. All at once, the innocent card game in the clouds is a clue to another, more sinister game that lovely Laura Black is playing. She's trying to keep me in the deal until she can raise her score just enough to win. It's like putting me on an important job for the commies so that the FBI won't want to call me off that job, even to testify at the trial. If that's the game, then they know I'm an FBI spy. Or do they? For a long time, I stare at my cards unseeingly. A long time. What's the matter, Matt? Hmm, what? Make up your mind. We're coming into Buffalo. Uh, all right. I'm not going to bite. You refuse all those juicy points? Yes, I'm going out. Operator. Oh, operator, I was connected with my party long distance. There's no time to... Hello? Hello? Oxford? We were cut off. You say you were calling from Buffalo Airport? Yes, and I want to know if you heard from my mother. I wired her to call you. She called. I recognized her voice and got your message. I wanted to be covered here in Buffalo. Don't worry. Where's the girl? Getting plane reservations for New York now. Go ahead, then. Look, does this make sense or am I getting in an uproar? I just got a brainwave that the Reds know I'm FBI and are letting me string along here so they won't call me to testify. Or am I screwy? No, you're not. It makes sense, Matt. What do I do? Play the game out to the finish, that's all. Stay with me, fellas. Stay with me, huh? On that, you can depend. I've got the ring off. Here comes the gal. So long. So long. Buffalo American Products Corporation. Baxter and Baxter Law Offices. Fantas and Arbogast. Stop here. May I help you? Yes. Will you tell Mr. Arbogast that Miss Black is here? Oh, yes, Miss Black. He's expecting you. Go right in. Thank you. Will you wait out here, Matt? What else have I got to do? Give me your revolver, please. What? Your revolver. Why? Because I asked for it. Don't you trust me with a gun? Perhaps I don't trust Mr. Arbogast without a gun. I have definite orders from Revchenko to go armed. You have definite orders from him to take orders from me. Your gun, please. All right. Don't shoot yourself in the foot. Thank you. Wait here. I sit in the small waiting room of Fantas and Arbogast advertising, waiting. The typewriter thumps louder. My heart begins to stumble crazily. A needling perspiration chills my whole body. Panic takes charge. I stand up. Get out of here. Run for it. If I did, would that crisp piquet blouse reach for a gun and start shooting? Nonsense. That best girlfriend of the bride wouldn't shoot anybody. But I don't try to go out. Thanks for waiting. It's been a joy. Here's your revolver. Thanks. Come on. A 
thought you were making plane reservations to New York. How come the bus? The object is to deceive. Deceive who? The FBI. Yeah? Just for example. Good example. Well, you know they have stool pigeons among us. Yes. Then why do you ask such stupid questions? I happen to be stupid. I wonder. I'm especially stupid about that gun in the waiting room. We won't discuss it. All right. You do all the talking. I want to go to sleep now. I'll take care of that briefcase for you, if you I'll like. I'll take care of it, thank you. Good night, Mr. Svetik. Matt. Hmm? Matt. It's gone. Huh? The briefcase is gone. What? Shh. When? I don't know. I thought you might be able to tell me. Well, I was fast asleep. I mean, what kind of a lopsided remark do you call never that? Never mind, anyhow? never mind. Never mind? You sit there and imply that well, I we may... We both can't sit here and argue about it. What are we supposed to do about it? Well, I'll have to go back and report to Rivchenko. And then call Washington. See if you can get a new set of data? Yes. You go on to New York. Without the briefcase? We haven't got it, have we? What happens to me, arriving empty-handed? It'll be worse if you disobey orders. Hold the door, driver. I'm getting off here. Laura is gone. The briefcase is gone. And we're underway again. In the gloom of the bus, I check the chambers of my gun. A gun is still loaded. That's something... And another thing is that I'm still safe. It's still dark when we roll into New York. I go to the hotel. There's a note waiting for me. Meet me, Pier 11, East River, urgent. No signature. I go outside. My throat is dry and my palms are moist. Meet whom? Why, on a dark, lonely waterfront? Taxi! Taxi! The bulldog edition of a paper on the driver's seat. The headline says, FBI plant takes stand against accused Reds today. Now. Now, if the Reds suspect me, they can knock me off. And no bearing on the case whatever. Here goes. darkest hour before dawn, waiting behind a stack of packing cases, waiting. Steps. I slip my revolver from my shoulder holster, slip the safety catch, and wait. A beam of light spears my eyes and I go blind, blind and wild, and my finger tugs at the trigger. Nothing happens. The gun won't fire. Hold it, Svetty. Who is it? One of the cartridges might be good. Oh, Oxford. Yeah. I'll take the gun now. You left that note in my box. Sure, I didn't know if you or your comrade contact would check in first. In fact, I couldn't be sure it was you until just now. You can get killed that way. Hmm. Not with your gun. It's full of blanks. Blanks? Well, that, that's why Laura took my gun away. Now I'll take it, Matt. They do suspect me, then. Hmm? If they did, they wouldn't have loaded your gun with blanks. I don't get it. I give up. Our agents checked all landings at Buffalo until they latched on to you and Conrad Laura. They tailed you to Fantas and Arbogast. Advertising. Go on. After you left, we picked up Arbogast on a long-standing illegal immigration rap. They can't possibly connect his arrest with you. And while we were there, we found out that Fantas and Arbogast, advertising is a cover for a microfilming laboratory up there. That uh, tiny, tiny film thing? Tiny enough to roll up and fit into a cartridge, emptied of powder, and the lead replaced, yeah. Are you telling me they microfilmed the stuff on that briefcase and put it into the cartridges of my gun? Well, here they are. And they didn't go off, did they? I'm in trouble. Comrade Laura never lost the briefcase on that bus. Our agents were on board watching... She slipped it to a Confederate while you slept. We let them. 
We'll get them in Washington when they try to put the data back in the files. Yeah, and I'm in trouble. I've got to go back to the hotel and give Mr. Penrose, whoever he is, my gun with those microfilm bullets in it. Right. You got it. Here's your gun back. Well, what about the bullets? It's got bullets with doctored microfilm in them. I've reloaded your gun with FBI prepared ammunition. It'll make the Kremlin very, very happy with you, Matt. And it won't do them any good at all. <laughs> Feel better? Uh, clever, you bourgeois bloodhounds. Well, we got to be, or we'd all be in the doghouse. Get going, Matt. You don't want to keep the Kremlin waiting. I leave Pier 11 feeling great, exhilarated. The card game in the clouds has come down to earth with plenty of inside stuff for high stakes. And I've won. And then, I think, no, the game isn't over yet. I've just won the deal. The long gamble is still ahead of me. And when the final chips are down, I'll be on my own. I'm a communist for the FBI. I walk alone. Our star, Dana Andrews, will return in a moment. This is Dana Andrews with a word about the story you've just heard. In this story, as in all others, names, dates, and places are fictitious to protect innocent persons. Many of these stories are based on incidents in the life of Matt Savetic, who worked undercover for the FBI. Next week, another fantastic adventure. Join us, won't you? I was a communist for the FBI. Starring Dana Andrews in an exciting tale of danger and espionage, I was a communist for the FBI. From the actual records and authentic experiences of Matt Savetic come many of the incidents in this unusual story. Here is our star, Dana Andrews, as Matt Savetic, who for nine fantastic years lived as a communist for the FBI. In all these fantastic years, fear was my worst enemy. The average man in the normal course of events comes face to face with fear only a few times in his life. But I faced the terror of fear almost constantly for nine years as a communist for the FBI. In a moment, listen to Dana Andrews as Matt Savetic, undercover man. As Matt Sabetic, undercover man. This story from the confidential file is marked The American Kremlin. An early spring afternoon in a large Midwestern city. The sun has found its way through the haze that shrouds the downtown business section and is drying the remnants of a morning shower. 
I decided to walk from my rooming house to the meeting at party headquarters, an unobtrusive address on an undistinguished side street. Have yeah, mister? No, thanks, Cabby. I'll walk. I think you'd better ride, mister. Ten, four, seven. Seven is a lucky number. You're clear. No one following. Why the emergency contact? Two top agents, the MVT, have been smuggled into the country. Their job, to close any loopholes in party machinery. Who are they? We don't know who they are, what they look like. But so far, they've been efficient. Too efficient. Two of our New York contacts disappeared. There's a chance these agents are here right now. You see them, we want them. Now, don't waste any time calling your contact. Anything to report? No. Okay, you can let me out. Two top agents of the MVD here to check on their own party members. They're never sure of themselves or the people who work for them and with them. For how can you really trust a man who's a traitor to his own country? It's still rather early for my meeting, but there before me is the party headquarters. Outwardly, it resembles some of the other faded and forlorn buildings on the street. But there, the resemblance ends. For this building is the nerve center of the entire communist network in this section of the country. This is the American Kremlin. Comrade Barstow? Comrade Barstow! The door to Barstow's office is open. I walk in. Barstow? Not here. Beyond this office, the printing presses. I start to call Barstow's name. But the words choke in my throat. There, above me, dangling like a limp cord of an overhead light, hanging and swaying from a pipe which runs across the ceiling, the body of Comrade Barstow. I look around for the box or platform which he used to raise himself off the ground. But there is none. The floor beneath his swaying feet is clear. This isn't suicide. This is murder. Hello? Yes? Is it done? Yes. I stagger wildly out of the building, gasping for air. Sure, I'm scared. I didn't recognize that voice on the other end of the phone. Let's hope I wasn't recognized either. Why did I answer it? Call it an automatic reaction. A phone rings, you answer it. Just like you see a body swinging from a pipe and you know it's murder. Except in this case, there's a frame attached to it. And I could be the picture inside. I can't understand why the building is empty. The presses should be rolling a symphony of inky lies and some of my beloved comrades should be at the door. Of course. This is Sunday. And even a communist sometimes takes advantage of a decadent bourgeois custom. Like not working. I walk around the block and then I spot Comrade Cover, A local party leader entering the building I just left. The American Kremlin. <laughs> wait about two minutes, and then I walk back in. Who is there? Oh, it's me, Comrade Svedek. Quickly, lock the door and come back here. I had seen only Comrade Kova enter the building, yet... Comrade Svedek, this is Colonel Polanski, who is here from Moscow. It is my privilege. Open the door to the press room, Comrade Kova, so that Comrade Svedek may also see. Pasta. Who did? Either my eyes are playing tricks on me or else I didn't get a good look the first time. For there, under the swaying feet of Comrade Barstow, is a box. Yes, Comrade Zwerk? Barstow realized that any weakness in our party structure is dangerous to the entire course. You may close the door, Comrade Cover. 
Comrade Svedek, Colonel Polanski has asked me to recommend a man to take Barthos' place. I have recommended you. I'm here to serve. When the revolution comes, our strength will lie in the instrument of the workers, the trade unions. Your first assignment, Comrade Svedek, is the shipbuilders' union in the Brooklyn Navy Yard. There's a train which leaves in exactly 40 minutes. You will be on it. Your contact is the waitress in the King Street Diner. Her name, Millicent Johnson. Comrade Cover here will give you specific instructions. Uh, about uh, Barstow. You have seen nothing. You know nothing. Wait for me, Comrade Svetik. I will accompany you to the station. Oh, don't bother, Comrade Cover. No bother, Comrade Svetik. Who knows when I may see you next? <laughs> He helps me pack. He helps me find a cab. He's too much of a help. He's right with me as we enter the railroad station. I buy a ticket. Look at the clock. There's less than ten minutes to train time. Ten minutes in which I should get to a phone and tell the FBI that one of the two MVD agents is right here. But how to do it without arousing suspicion on the part of Comrade Cover, who is being most solicitous and most comradely. Comrade Cover, will you watch my bag while I wash my hands? Sure, go ahead. Hello? Three and four are seven. Comrade Svetik, whom are you calling? Oh, I, I was just checking the time with Meridian. The last thing I see as the train picks up momentum and speeds out of the station is Comrade Cover standing on the platform and smiling goodbye. I've been cornered, boxed and shipped. Eight hours before the train arrives in New York. Eight hours before I can get to a phone, contact the FBI, and tell them the MVD agents have arrived. Eight hours in which Colonel Polanski and the hatchet woman on the phone could be in Dallas, Chicago, Los Angeles. You pick the spot. Penn Station, a canyon of noise and activity. I disregard the porter with the outstretched hand waiting to take my bag and head for a telephone booth. I call home to my FBI contact and reverse the charges. Hello? What are you doing in New York? I'm on my way to the Brooklyn Navy Yard, replacing a local comrade who was killed. Details? August Borstoff, party courier. Murder made to look like suicide. The body was still hanging in the press room when I left eight hours ago. Be careful how you check it. I don't think anybody knows except myself, Comrade Cover, and one of the two MVD agents you're looking for. Name? Colonel Polanski. I think his partner is a woman. What's my Brooklyn contact number? Your Brooklyn contact number is... Well, let me, mister. Hello, Millicent. Hello, yourself. Brooklyn isn't near Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh isn't near Brooklyn. We've been expecting you. The meeting starts in 30 minutes. I finish here in 10. I'll get you a cup of coffee while you're waiting for me. What about a place to sleep? We have a room for you. Hey, Millie, I'll buy some cybers. Brooklyn headquarters is an innocuous three-story brownstone a couple of blocks from the waterfront. A converted rooming house which boards all the local agents. I'll be under constant surveillance here. Is this by design or accident? Ah, oh, Comrade Millicent. Come in. And this is... Comrade Svedek from out of town. How do you do? How do you do? Where is uh, Comrade Aachen? She's due here any minute. She, Comrade Smith? Yes, Comrade Hedwig Aachen. One of our most brilliant party members. Direct from the Stalin Institute. Are you discussing me? Ah, Comrade Arkin. This is Comrade Svetik. Here is Barstow. I'm taking his place. 
Comrade Smith, how did he get here? Comrade Millicent brought him. How do we know he's not an FBI spy? He identified himself correctly. Oh, so, but how do we know? Well, this is childish. You can check me whenever you please. I'm here to carry out a mission. Which is? The Shipbuilders Union. I'm satisfied. Comrade Millicent, you have contacted one of the union men? Yes, Hans Martin. He's been a party member for two years, and he's anxious to do what he can. Comrade Spetic, this is an important union. They are at work on some vital naval projects. So far, we have only been able to win over Martin. But one man in there is not enough. He will help you join the union. When do I meet Comrade Martin? He comes into the diner every day before his shift, around quarter after three. You be at the diner tomorrow, and I'll introduce you. There are other items on the agenda, so I just sit back and listen. I listen and look and catalog their faces. What is the connection between Hedvig Aachen and Comrade Barstaff? Was she the voice on the phone? There being no further business to discuss, the meeting is adjourned. Comrade Svetik, may I speak with you alone? What about? Alone. Come into the hall. What's on your mind? Why did you kill Barstaff? What did you say? Why did you kill Barstov? to Dana Andrews, starring as Matt Sabetic in I Was a Communist for the FBI, and the second act of our story. This was it. Fear again. Fear projected by the cold, deadly, accusing voice of Comrade Hedvig Aachen. Why did you kill Barstaff? I had to stall for time. The best defense is an aggressive offense. I grabbed her arm and replied... What did you say? Why did you kill Barstow? Let go of my arm. You're hurting me. Come on. Let go. Let go. What is the meaning of this? Come on, Comrade Aachen. Repeat what you just asked. You fool. I said repeat what you asked me. I will hear it from you, Comrade Svetik. She asked me why I killed Barstow. Comrade Aachen, you place yourself in a very bad position with such a question. How many times have you seen Comrade Barstow? And under what circumstances? Was there a romantic attachment Comrade between Smith, you and... Comrade Smith, you exceed yourself. Comrade Smith, perhaps Comrade Aachen's suspicions might be alleviated by a long-distance phone call. And you might ask Comrade Cover why Colonel Polanski recommended me. Colonel Polanski? Comrade Smith, I wish to withdraw my charge against Comrade Smith. Good night. <laughs> The next morning, I use an empty cigarette pack as an excuse to get out of the house and call my Brooklyn contact. Hello? Three and four are seven. Seven is a lucky number. Have you made contact? I'm living at local headquarters. Nothing to report as yet. Did you hear from out west? Party headquarters had a visit from the local building inspector, but everything was in order. Did they find Barstow's body? No. Was Barstow an FBI contact? No. Okay, if he were, you wouldn't tell me. Any other contact besides you? The shoeshine man outside the King Street subway station. Tell him you prefer a red polish. A deep red polish. Three o'clock, and I'm sitting at a table in the corner of the diner. And over in the opposite corner, a fat, paunchy individual blows the steam off a spoonful of soup. It's during my second cup of coffee that Hans Martin comes over to the table. Sit down. You're Millie's friend? And your friend, Hans Martin. First, we've got to get you into the union. There's a meeting of our shift tonight at 11.30. The business agent for the union will be there. You meet me at 11.30 and I'll introduce you as my cousin. Where is the meeting? In the warehouse off Pier 9. And don't worry, nobody will stop you. Just walk past Pier 10 and across the cutover, which you can't miss. Meet me at the entrance to the warehouse. I 
I walk out of the diner with Hans Martin. Walk him partway back to the pier. As we pass the King Street subway station, I say goodbye to him. Shine, mister? I start to say yes, but as I look up, I see Colonel Polanski coming out of the subway. He looks straight at me, through me, and around me, and walks on. Shine, mister? Oh, yeah. I, I, I prefer a red polish, a deep red polish. Oh, well, 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 my cab driver from home, how come? I had a feeling out there that you might be heading into something. I can't get over the feeling I'm being watched. I sit back in the shine chair and let my eyes wander. Sure enough, across the street is a fat man who had been blowing steam from his soup spoon in the diner. Anything to report? Colonel Polanski. What about him? Can't talk. Being watched. Well, there you are, sir. You the shoe, please. <laughs> As I walk away from the shoeshine stand, I notice that the fat man has disappeared from the doorway. Rather than walk the four blocks back to the party headquarters, I take the trolley. Was the fat man really watching me? Did I do anything to give myself away? Oh, nuts. I'm falling for the old commie trick. But the guilty man will always worry. The innocent man will only be confused. As I start up the stairs to the three-story brownstone, I turn around and freeze. There, across the street, is the fat man. I shut the door behind me and run up the stairs into the meeting room. Ah, Comrade Svetik. Colonel Polanski. What is it, Comrade Svetik? You look perturbed. I think I've been followed. He's right across the street. Who? The man who's been following me. Look. Polanski and Smith cautiously move across the room and through a parting, and the drapes get a good look at the fat man standing on the other side of the street. <laughs> Comrade Smith, will you leave us alone? Yes, Colonel. <laughs> well, this is no laughing matter. <laughs> easy, Comrade Sverik, easy. I watch as Colonel Polanski lowers and raises the window shade twice, and then see the fat man across the street come up the steps and into the brownstone house. A minute later, the door to the room opens again, and he waddles into the room and smiles at me with the lower part of his face. His eyes can never smile. Commissar Turin, this is Comrade Sverik. Commissar, I'm honored. So, it is you who have taken Comrade Bastov's place. <laughs> This is the other member of the two-man team from the MVD. This is the voice on the telephone. I watched you handle your contact in the diner, and I'm very pleased to know that we have such workers in the party. Good. Comrade Zverik, what have you arranged? I'm to meet Hans Martin on the pier tonight at 11.30. He's introducing me as his cousin to the business agent of the union. I should have no trouble. Ah, my dear comrade, but the test of a good agent is to always be prepared for trouble. Uh, Colonel Polanski will accompany you. Uh, in the meantime, I suggest you get some sleep. Uh, you look tired. At exactly 11, Colonel Polanski knocks on the door of my room and takes me down to the car he has rented, especially for the occasion. He opens the back door for me, and there is Commissar Turin. Oh, come in quickly, Comrade Svetik. The night air is a bit cold. Comrade Svetik, you wonder why a commissar and a colonel should accompany you on such a routine matter. My duty is not to wonder... Just to obey. Very convincing, Comrade Svetik. You should not have run out of the building where you found Bastov's body after you spoke to me on the phone. Oh, yes, do not look startled. It was you. And you should not have entered the building a second time and acted as if it were the first time you had seen the body of Comrade Bastov. And finally, you should not have called the FBI. This is some sort of joke. I don't get it. Oh, come now, comrade Svetik, spy, traitor, fascist tool of the FBI. Let us put an end to pretenses. If, if it, as you say, I am an agent for the FBI, why do you accompany me to my meeting with Hans Martin? Why don't you just kill me now? You have an appointment with him. 
If you do not appear, he will ask questions. Commissar, we are approaching Pier 10. Turn your lights off. Why was Comrade Barstaff killed? Let us say he served the cause. Served the cause? Yes. To trap any traitors in our ranks. And we did trap you, didn't we? I shall put it all in my report tomorrow. Moscow will be pleased. Bear in mind that Colonel Polanski and I are both armed. Now we shall get out and keep our date with Hans Martin. The shrill whistle of the tugs... The basso boom of the larger vessels are playing a funeral dirge across the night winds of the Brooklyn waterfront, carrying the coffin to its final resting place. You think you get accustomed to staring death in the face, only... Where's that light coming from? Drop your guns! An FBI threat! This is my cue. I make a dive for shelter behind some piling. I miss my target. Find myself choking. The water drags me down, choking, gasping, fighting my way up. I break for air, and I hear the barking of guns punctuating the stillness of the night. There's an eerie quiet, and then... Betty! Betty, are you all right? Just a little wet, that's all. Here, grab this rope, and I'll pull you up. Thanks. Where are Turin and Polanski? We've got them. Are they dead? I don't know. The boys will find out. How did you manage to get here? We've had a stakeout on local headquarters ever since you arrived. The shoeshine man reported your contact, and when you got in the car tonight, we just followed. Did anybody else know of their suspicion? I don't think so. But I'm supposed to meet a party member on Pier 9 at 11.30. What time is it? Well, that's the 11.30 break now. Uh, what do I do? Tell him you slipped and fell overboard to explain your wetsuit. We'll take care of Polanski and Turin. Well... What are you waiting for? As I make my way to Pier 9, the calm of the waterfront is as before. As if those gunshots had never been. As if Polanski and Turin had never been. But there will always be more Polanskis and more Turins. For this fight I'm in is a lonely fight. An undercover man who must forsake his friends and family for the false friendship of the comrades in the party. I must continue this fight alone as I walk alone. Dana Andrews will return in just a moment. This is Dana Andrews with a word about the story you've just heard. In this episode, as in all others, names, dates, and places are fictitious to protect innocent people. However, party headquarters, described as the American Kremlin, did exist. And similar places will continue to operate in this country until we won the fight against communism. Next week, another exciting adventure based on Matt Savetic's experience as an undercover man, a communist for the FBI. So join us, won't you? I was a communist for the FBI. Starring Dana Andrews in an exciting tale of danger and espionage, I was a communist for the FBI. Many 
of the incidents in the story you are about to hear are based on the actual records and authentic experiences of Matt Savetic, who for nine fantastic years lived as a communist for the FBI. Here is our star, Dana Andrews, as Matt Savetic. I was in it for nine long years, a member of the party. I lived with communists, worked with them, watched them. I learned their methods, their tricks, their plans, and their weaknesses. This is my story, the story of my life as a communist for the FBI. In a moment, listen to Dana Andrews as Matt Savetic, Undercover Man. Here is Dan Andrews as Matt Sabetic, FBI undercover man. This story from the confidential file is marked Tight Wire. There's no eight hour day for an undercover man, no 40 hour week. The working day is 24 hours, the week is seven days long. It's not a job, it's a way of life, a tough way, and a dangerous one. You've got to be ready for anything, anytime. Play it tight, and you play it smart, or you're out of the game. And there's only one way out, the hard way. Whenever possible, you plan your schedule to contact the FBI. But they don't have a schedule, of course, so you never know when or how. Taxi, mister? No, thanks. I'm not going far. Taxi's better than walking, though, Mr. Fisher. Oh, did you say Fisher? Yeah. I was sure I recognized you, Mr. Fisher. Some buddies of mine, a friend of yours. How about a ride? Okay. I guess a taxi will save time. Sure. Time and shoe leather. My name's Davis. Transferred last week from the FBI office in Chicago. I see. Who are some of your buddies, Mr. Davis? Richards, Spaulding, Blake... Barkley's the district inspector here. And... Okay, that's good enough. I was just checking. Smart idea. You never know. What's up, Davis? Got a job for you, Matt. Maybe a rough one. What kind of a job? What's that meeting you told us about? The one for that big shot from the West Coast? Yeah, Lado Corini. Mm-hmm. He's one of the national coordinators. The meeting's Thursday evening. There'll be cell chairman here from 10th State. So there'll be names named, people, places, plans, so on. Matt... We've got to have all that verbatim. Verbatim? Yeah. I dictograph. Dictograph? What about that new radio gimmick? That miniature transmitter? You can't always be sure of it, Matt. We might hit a static problem, miss half the meeting. Now, here's what we want. Between now and Thursday evening, plant a microphone and wire the meeting hall. That's all? Yeah. <laughs> I know. We're not giving you much time. But the job's got to be done, Matt. Go to it. <laughs> There it was. Why the hall? It sounded simple. I knew it was going to be one of the toughest jobs I'd ever done for the FBI. The party offices were on the same floor as the hall, and they'd be in use all week. Davis gave me two button microphones, 500 feet of bell wire, and his best wishes. It was all up to me. <laughs> At 7 o'clock that evening, the cell leads met to discuss plans for the big meeting. I was present at the table. I had a plan of mine. All right, comrades. Now, we're pretty well lined up on how to handle the delegates from out of town. I don't think there'll be more than 85. You agree, uh, Comrade Mapes? Carl Jones was cell chairman at the time. Definitely, Comrade Jones. 85 is more than safe. Dan Mapes, the local secretary, a transfer from Kansas City. Then we'll plan accordingly. Now, is there anything else we have to work out? Yes, there is, as a matter of fact. Let's talk about security measures. This meeting is big. Agents' names will be mentioned. Our few plans will be discussed. The FBI would love to get in on it. True enough. But unless there's been some new development, I don't see why... There you... has been a new development. Take a look. What is it? A piece of wire. Where did you get it, Comrade Svetik? In the corridor. 
a few feet from the door of the hall. Oh, my goodness. It was caught between the edge of the rug and the baseboard. I saw it by sheer accident. It's Mike Wire, all right. I'll bet on it. And I'd say there's only one answer. The FBI has got in somehow. Yeah, that was my idea. Comrade Sweddick, I'd like you to follow this up. All right, comrade. Go over the hall with a fine tooth comb. Your job is to find microphone. To it. I'd played an outside chance. I'd an approach right in the open, and it had worked. My orders from the FBI were to wire the hall, and my job for the commies was to find the FBI's wire, the same wire I was going to install myself. With a little luck, I might combine the two jobs. But luck was just what I didn't have. Morning, Comrade Sveti. Oh, Comrade Etheridge. What are you doing here? Well, uh, you don't act very glad to see me, Matt. Well, no, it's not that, Ben. I'm surprised, that's all. Comrade Jones said I'd have the hall to myself today. To look for that FBI wiring job. Yeah, yeah, I know. I've been assigned to help you. You know, Matt, there's only one way the FBI could have wired this place. How's that? By having an agent planted in the cell. Yeah. I thought of the same thing, Ben. I've been keeping my eyes open. Any results? No. Not yet, at least. Well, let's get to work. Any time. We'll start at one corner of the hall and go over it in the square yard at a time. Mm -hmm. Floor, walls, ceiling, everything. Mm -hmm. Okay, Ben, let's go to work. Well, my bright idea was knocked right in the head. I'd planned to make the installation during my supposed search. But now, with Comrade Ben Etheridge breathing down my neck, I didn't have a chance. All I could do was go through the motions and try to figure some other angle. It was four in the afternoon when we finished our shakedown of the hall. Well, I guess that's everything, Matt. There ought to be another screwdriver. Oh, yeah. Here it is. Well, what do you think? You tell me. We covered every square foot and didn't find anything. I'd say the hall's clean. But what about that piece of uh, mic wire, Matt? I don't know. It got into the hall some way. But the FBI hasn't planted any microphone in here, I'll swear to it. Well, I'll take your word for it, Matt. My word for it? Look, Ben, were you assigned to help me or watch me? Well, Chairman thought you kind of jumped at the job. A little of both, I guess. <laughs> So now, added to everything else, the chairman was suspicious. I'd wasted a day, and there was less than two more days to go. Dozens of names would be mentioned at the meeting. Plans discussed, information the FBI needed badly. That hall had to be wired somewhere. Richard speaking. Fisher here, Bob Fisher. Check. Go ahead. Listen, that wire job's not going so good. It's got to go. Washington really wants this one. Yeah, I know. Look, I've got wax impressions of a couple of door keys. Took them right under my helper's nose this afternoon. How long will it take to get duplicates made? Thirty minutes. What are they for? The meeting hall and the alley door of the building. I'm going to slip in late tonight and string that wire. Look, I'm calling from the phone booth in the Gavin Hotel lobby. I'll leave the key impressions behind the coin box. Check. We'll pick them up in ten minutes. Where do you want the keys delivered? Leave them behind the cushions in the next to last booth in the hotel coffee shop. Any time before nine. Right. Watch yourself, boy. You know it. Good luck. The keys were there when I went in at nine o'clock that evening. I slipped them into my pocket, ordered and ate slowly, while I read a couple of papers. Timing was the one important thing. I knew that between 10.45 and 10.48, the watchman would be punching the clock on the seventh floor at the far end of the hall. And during those three minutes, I had to get in that alley door. 
The time was 10.47 when I slipped my key into the lock of the alley door. I closed the door behind me, hurried along the corridor, and began climbing the service stairs. I was almost to the third floor when the switch was thrown up above me. And I heard the elevator coming down the shaft. I froze in the dark stairway and waited. Good. The night watchman was back on the first floor again, and the coast was clear. I climbed a few remaining steps, hurried along the third floor corridor, and fitted my second key in the lock of the meeting hall. Inside, I took the microphone buttons and the wire from my coat pocket and went to work. In 20 minutes, the job was done, inside the hall, that is. But the final connection in the shaft meant a few ticklish minutes swinging on an iron ladder over empty space. I used my knife blade to spring the catch on the shaft door. And I slid it open, stepped in on the ladder, and closed the door. I could see the top of the elevator three stories below me, and the height made me sick and dizzy. I worked quickly and had just finished the connection when the elevator started up. There was no space in the shaft for me and the elevator. No time to get out the door. I did the only thing I could. As the elevator reached me, I stepped onto the top and clung to the cable. We kept going up. Sixth floor. Seventh. I could see the spinning drums winding the cable above me. Coming closer and closer. Eighth floor. One more to go. The drums were right over my head. I threw myself flat on the top of the elevator. When we stopped, I had barely 18 inches clearance. When the watchman closed the doors and started back down the shaft, I clung to the iron ladder and stayed there until he reached the main floor. Then I fumbled at the catch on the shaft door, slid it open, and stepped out onto the ninth floor. Okay, Matt, don't move. Ben, what are you doing here? Waiting for an FBI stool pigeon. For you, Matt. I, I don't know what... Now back to Dana Andrews, starring as Matt Sivetic in I Was a Communist for the FBI... And the second act of our story. I stood there in the dim corridor in front of the elevator, staring at the gun in Ben's hand. One move and he'd kill me, he'd said. And I knew he would. Ben impressed people as being good-natured and easygoing, but underneath, he was a fanatic. I knew that, and I knew he meant what he'd said. Matt... What are you doing here this time of night? I'm just looking around, Ben. Checking up on things. What things? What were you doing in the elevator shaft? Look, comrade. Maybe I've got a couple of questions of my own. What's your reason for being here? A hunch, Matt. I got to thinking. So I came over, had the night watchman let me in. I don't follow you. Got to thinking. What? How it'd be a smart idea for an FBI agent planted in the party... To search the hall with a witness, and then come back and put in a microphone after the search. I'm afraid that's pretty weak, Ben. Weak? Yeah. I think we'd better talk to the chairman. I'm way ahead of you, Matt. We're going downstairs to the party office. I'm going to phone him and have him come right over. Okay. And don't forget, Matt, the gun's still loaded. Comrade Etheridge snapped on the lights in the party office and called Chairman Jones and told him what had happened. Then we sat and waited for Jones to arrive. I kept trying to think of some way out. One fortunate thing, I'd hidden the keys, the extra wire, and my tools on top of a girder in the elevator shaft. I was clean, and that was some advantage, but not much. Well, you made a quick trip. Sounded as though the situation called for it. Well, Comrade Svedik... It seems we've been mistaken about you. That depends on what you mean by mistake. Shut up! Get up, Svetik. How long have you been working for the FBI? I haven't been, comrade. That's your mistake. Mistake? 
When Comrade Etheridge caught you right in the act tonight, there are a couple of ways of looking at that. Look, Comrade Jones, you're the one in charge here, aren't you? Of course. And why is Ben holding the gun? Well, I, I wasn't trying to take over any authority. Here you are. Thanks. Feel better now, Svetik? Yes, it was making me nervous having a gun pointed at me by an FBI agent. Oh, no, wait a minute. Ben, you claimed you came here tonight because you suspected me of planting a microphone in the hall. All right, where's the mic? Well, I, I didn't have any chance to look for it, you know that. But the mic was there this afternoon, Ben. Why didn't you find it then? Huh? What are you driving at, Svetik? One of the sections of the hall Ben searched included the electric outlets next to the radiators. Did you take the cover plates off those outlets, Ben? Well, no. They hadn't been tampered with, and it... One of them had. It's got a button mic planted in it. What are you talking... The wire runs behind the baseboard. I saw it this afternoon. How come you didn't? Well, there wasn't any wire. There couldn't have been. I don't see how you could have missed it. That's why I didn't say anything this afternoon, and that's why I came back tonight. Wait a minute, Svetik. Maybe you wired the place tonight before Ben caught you. How? As you said, Ben caught me. Search me now. I don't have any wire or tools. The hall is locked. I don't have a key to it. That's another thing, Svetik. How did you get into the building? Ask the watchman. <laughs> watchman, that's a joke. What do you mean? The front door of the building was unlocked tonight, and the watchman was asleep in the lobby. I walked right in past him, and he didn't even move. Security. A microphone planted in the hall, and my so-called helper didn't even see it. Now, take it easy, Comrade. All right, so I'm mad, and I've got a right to be. The party's the biggest thing in my life. I'm giving my life to it. And when things happen like they have today, a helper who's either too stupid or too crooked to see a microphone when he stumbles over it, uh, now, and a so-called watchman who goes off to sleep and leaves the door of the building wide open, of course I'm mad. Well, it worked. Temporarily, at least, I was off the hook, as far as my party membership was concerned. But the last chance of getting that hall wired had gone right out the window. Davis, the FBI agent, agreed when I told him the story the next morning. You went at it the right way, Matt. There's no question about that. You just had a run of bad luck, that's all. Look, Davis, I've been thinking about this most of the night. I've got a halfway idea. It may sound crazy, well, but... Let's have it. I haven't even got a halfway one. Well, Richards was telling me a couple of months ago about that new miniature shortwave transmitter. Yeah, but we only use that as a last resort, Matt. This is a last resort. How big are they? Oh, about the size of a couple packs of cigarettes. What do you got in mind? It has a built-in mic, I suppose. Oh, yeah, it's a complete unit. You just switch it on, and it's good for well, about 20 hours of continuous transmitting. Life of the batteries. Davis, suppose one of those transmitters were planted in the hall. Could you pick it up? Sure. They've got a radius of about six blocks. We could park a truck on the street as a mobile receiving unit. But, but can you do it, Matt? With a little luck, I think I can. I arrived at the hall at five in the afternoon, and I noticed that several baskets of flowers sent by the front organizations had already been delivered and placed on the speaker's table. The basket from my own group, the Pan-Slav Congress, wasn't there yet. Good. So far, the plan was working. Uh, Matt. Huh? Oh, hello, Ben. I, uh, I shouldn't have jumped at conclusions last night, Matt. When I found you here in the building, well, I thought, sure... Don't forget it. I was pretty rough on you, as far as that's concerned. No, no, I just followed up. I don't know how I could have missed that mic. It's a matter of training. I remembered later that you said you'd never had... Matt! Yeah, Carl? There's some guy here from the garden florist. Says he's got a flower order for you. Oh, yeah. It's the bouquet for the speaker's table for the Panslav Congress. I'll take care of it. Thanks. You the fellow that ordered the flowers? That's right. Thanks. Just sign here, please. All right. The transmitter's in the basket. It's already turned on. Fine. Good luck. Thanks, Richard. There you are. Thank you, sir. Goodbye. Well, now, you went pretty elaborate on it, didn't you, Matt? Four dozen roses. Comrade Carini is an important man, Greta. Only the best. Mmm, they smell wonderful. Those must have been specially selected. That's right. They were. Well, the transmitter was in the meeting hall and right on the speaker's table. It was already turned on, Richard said. 
And parked down the block somewhere was a panel delivery truck with a tape recorder and a pair of stenographers with headphones, taking down every word. My job was over. There was nothing to do but wait. Now, Matt, is that microphone you found still hooked up? Yeah, Comrade Jones decided we wouldn't disconnect it until just before the meeting. That way, the FBI wouldn't try to plant another one. Good idea. Catch them flat-footed. I wonder how they got in to install it. Well, with that watchman not paying attention to his... Oh, this must be Comrade Carini. Well, I guess so. Carl's bringing him over. Comrade Carini? Comrade Svetik. Comrade? Comrade? And Comrade Etheridge. What is this? Uh, why, they're flowers sent by the various organizations in honor of... I am sorry. What? The honor I appreciate. But the flowers must go. I have the allergy, you understand, the... The hay fever, I... I am unable to... Oh, I'm uh, sorry, comrade. I had no idea. Uh, well, we'll have them placed outside in the corner. Yeah. Matt, would you... Oh, yeah, sure. Ben, you grab a couple of these baskets. I'll take these at the end. I wish to cause no offense. Oh, that's but... all right, uh, comrade. It's, it's quite all right. <laughs> Quite all right. As far as I'm concerned, it was quite all wrong. In a few minutes, the meeting would start and the FBI wouldn't be in on it. Ben and I carried the flowers out and set them along the corridor. And suddenly I decided to take one last chance. Ben's back was turned. Quickly, I reached into the flower basket, fished out the transmitter, and dropped it into my inside coat pocket. Comrades! Comrades! Before I open this meeting, I wish to inform you that the FBI has managed to establish a beachhead in our very midst. Comrade Svetik? Yes, comrade? Can you take care of the matter? Of course. There you are. You see, comrades? A microphone. Right here. The FBI will be most disappointed. <laughs> And now I wish to present our national coordinator from West Coast Headquarters, Comrade Letso Corini. I sat through the meeting while name after name was mentioned, plan after plan discussed. The transmitter sagged my coat pocket, pressed against my chest. I was conscious of it every second, and conscious, too, of what would happen if the commies knew I had it. The only thing I didn't know, was it working all right? Was the stuff going through? Was the FBI getting it? I found out around midnight when I put through a call from the public phone booth. Richard speaking. Fisher here, Bob Fisher. Check. Nice work. Uh, Everything come through all right? Perfect. We got every word from start to finish. Good. One thing we couldn't figure, though. Who was beating that drum? Drum? Yeah. It kept up all through the meeting. Sounded like a funeral march. Well, there wasn't any drum that I... Hey, wait a second. I had the transmitter in the inside pocket of my coat, Richards. (laughs) That drum beating was my heart. I left the phone booth and walked along the street. It was after midnight, and the city had gone to bed. And I could hear my footsteps echoing against the dark fronts of the buildings. An hour before, I sat in a hall with a hundred people, supposedly my friends, my comrades. And now I'm alone. But I was alone then, too. Because they aren't my comrades. And I have no friends. That's how it is with me. I'm a communist for the FBI. I walk alone. Dana Andrews will return in just a moment. Next week, another exciting adventure for Matt Savetic's official records. Join us, won't you?
I was a communist for the FBI. Starring Dana Andrews in an exciting tale of danger and espionage, I was a communist for the FBI. From the actual records and authentic experiences of Matt Sebetic come many of the incidents in this unusual story. Here is our star, Dana Andrews, as Matt Sebetic, who for nine fantastic years lived as a communist for the FBI. Your friends avoid you. Your enemies smirk and say they always knew Matt Sebetic was the wrong number. Your mother accepts you as you are, with a reproach in her eyes, breaking your soul. Your dad gives you ten dollars to change your name so you won't disgrace the name of Svetic. Nine years of it, and you're talking to yourself like I'm doing now. In a moment, listen to Dana Andrews as Svetic, undercover man. Dana Andrews as Matt Sebetic, undercover man. This story from the confidential file is marked Where the Red Men Roam. It's a brilliant morning with 21 carat sunshine and the air diamond bright, but I'm seething. All morning I've been pushing doorbells, getting housewives to sign coming inspired peace petitions. Yesterday, I picketed an aircraft factory. The day before that, I dated a secretary to a war department official. Object, sedition. And the day before that, I solicited ads for the workers daily. And the day before that, I... Oh, never mind. All I know is that I'm suddenly sick of it all. Work, the party, discipline, the revolution. Until you drop in your tracks, Svetic. Until you wind up in the booby hatch, boob. Finally, I'm off duty, and I go to a phone booth to check out with Comrade Selinsky, the former MVD agent, now my cell chief and my chief beef in the local red setup. Yes? Comrade Savetic reporting and going off duty, Comrade Selinsky. Come down to headquarters at once. But I'm supposed to be off for once. I want to talk to you. Well, talk to me now. At headquarters, Comrade Savetic. Look, I've had one lousy, tough week, and I have a right at to... At headquarters, Comrade. Well, I haven't eaten. I'll get down when I can. Now. When I've had some lunch. And not before. And maybe not even then. Talk to me, Comrade Selensky. That was hours ago. Well, I hadn't had breakfast or lunch. I've been on the hoof all hours week. ago, Comrade Svedek. Well, I must have dropped off to sleep after lunch. You dropped off to sleep? I'm very sorry. Where did you drop off to sleep? Well, not on a park bench, that's for sure. Not at home, certainly. I called your home. Oh? You were not there. Well, as you know, Comrade, I'm not very welcome at home. Mother and Dad feel I've disgraced the family, turning communist. So I only go home to sleep at night. We searched all over for you. I, I took a room in a hotel. I was beat, I tell you. I'm tired. Perhaps I can arrange a holiday for you. What sort of holiday? You know Jacques Candos, the pianist, of course. I know his work. He's working for us now. I know that, too. His last concert was picketed by capitalist hirelings. I certainly think he was asking for it. So? Ah. The man makes a fortune in America, and when the orchestra struck up the national anthem in Detroit, Sandoz sits at his piano noodling at something. Whose national anthem? The Star Spangled Banner, of course. Of course. Look, Zelensky, we're operating in America. 
When in Rome, common self-interest dictates that we do as the Romans do. When in Rome, comrade, listen only to Caesar. Okay, I'm listening. Tomorrow night, Sandoz plays before a crowd of 3,000 at Hiawatha Dells. We expect violence. Why? Because we are planning violence. That figures. We will instigate a riot and blame reactionary anti-foreign elements in the crowd. By such devices, we win the foreign element in cities to our side. What's my part in all this? What about my holiday? As his last encore, Sandoz will play Chopin's revolutionary etude. This will be the signal for some of our comrades posing as reactionaries to start a riot. I see. You will see that members of your cell are dispersed in the audience, prepared for action. That's my big holiday? You need to stay to the end. Slip away when the fighting begins. Let the peasants do the dirty work. Candidly, you're too useful a man to risk in mob fighting. And you will enjoy the concert, I know. Now, how many tickets do you wish to buy for the concert? You mean I have to pay my way into this armed rhubarb? It all helps the party treasury. How many? How much? One dollar and eighty cents. One. Better make it two, Comets Vet. All I need is one. That will be three dollars and sixty cents, thank you. I'm burning. A holiday. The day and the evening off, and all I have to do is lead the fighting blood in my cell into battle at Hiawatha Dells. I wonder if the folks at home might have spilled something to Selinsky to make him honor me with this crummy assignment on my one day off in months. I find a pay station and dial home. Hello? Hello, Mom. Mom, I, I got a call from a man this afternoon. Did you answer the phone? No, Marty. But did he talk to him? How are you, son? I'm all right. I'm tired, but okay. Can I talk to Tip, please? You don't ask about Papa? How is Dad? Oh, not so good. I tell him you ask. Oh, here. Here is Tip. Yeah? How are you, Tip? How's the Navy? Fine. How's yours? Um, uh, Tip, a guy phoned for me this afternoon. Yeah. He had a deep red voice, sort of maroon. So? Did you tell him anything about me? I just told him you weren't here. Did he give you my message? No. No, he didn't give me a message. I told the comrade clear as day to have you call me when he located you. He never said a word to me real chum, the comrade. Yeah. What did you want? It isn't my idea. Mom wanted it. She wants us to go on a picnic tomorrow and wanted you to come along. Me? It wasn't my idea, believe me. I sure like that, but I'll call you back this evening. And thanks, Tip. It was Mom's idea. <laughs> sure, but thanks anyhow, Navy. Uh, let me see. What's that new FBI number to call? Oh. Are you serious, Matt? You dragged me away from adult FBI business to bench sit with you in the park and talk about picnics? I'm going back to the office. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute, will you? Anyhow, I thought your family was cold on you. Well, that's just it. They think I'm a red and I've lost them. And all at once, they asked me to go on a picnic with them. And, Chief, Chief, I've, I've got to. Yeah, but you've got to go to the Sandoz concert, too. Go to the Sandoz concert, pick it, get signatures, report to the FBI, get recruits for the party, scrape and bother Solinsky... Alinsky. Work myself ragged for him, and he can't give me a simple message. It might mean an awful lot to me. The picnic, you mean? The picnic, I mean. Look, I want to know. Can I go to that picnic with Mom and Tip? It sounds like, can I have a nickel for the movies years ago when I was a kid? I can't help it. Look, uh, could you persuade your folks to hold the picnic near Hiawatha Dells? Say, 
That may be something. Then you'd be close enough to slip away to the concert and do your job for the commies, too. Sure. Fixed? Yeah, they'll go for that. They'll buy that, I know. Because... Because Mom wants me along so much. Isn't it? Hiawatha Dells. It's a beautiful place. It used to be an Onondaga Indian village. You'll like it. Oh, I write it down. I'll be at the house at noon, okay? Oh, yeah. I pack good things, Matt. No cares, no worries. Just us, the Svetics, huh? Oh, yeah, son. I buy you red balloon again. <laughs> no, no, Mom. Anything but red. Oh, oh I forget something. What? Uh, Fremont 2311. What about it? A girl call you. She say, call Freeman 2311. A girl? Uh, Freeman 2311. Okay. I'll call her. I'll see you at noon tomorrow. Bye, Mom. Goodbye, sir. Hmm. This Fremont 2311? Oh, Mr. Smith? I was told to call this number. Oh, yes. That was me. Or er, I. Anyway, Tanya. I'm Tanya. Do I know it, Tanya? I was wondering if you could stop by tomorrow and pick me up. I'll be all ready. Pick you up? What for? Take me on a picnic with you. A picnic? Hey, listen, who are you? I'm Tanya Joseph. You're taking me to the picnic tomorrow. I don't know why I should, and I don't think I will. Why should I? Hello? I thought that in the party, you don't ask questions, Mr. Sedek. I'll pick you up a little before noon. 412 Forest Drive. See you then. See you then. I might have known it. Selinsky, a former MVD man, knowing all the infernal tricks of the Russian secret police. Watching me always now policing me with a girl named Tanya. They were all over. The watchers. Finding out. Knowing. Reporting. Punishing. There's no escape. No escape ever. Dana Andrews, starring as Matt Sibetic in I Was a Communist for the FBI, and the second act of our story. The apartment where Tanya Joseph lives is one of the better apartments in one of the better neighborhoods. I wonder if Miss Tanya Joseph figures on comparable diggings comes the revolution. Then Miss T. Joseph opens the door, and I receive a non-proletarian jolt. Miss Joseph, she's a looker. Oh, right on time. You come in. Said the spider to the fly. Pardon? Nothing. Practicing my mumbling is all. Most spiders are harmless, even useful. Then you did hear. I think. Some of them are black widows, but it takes all kinds, doesn't it? <laughs> I hate black, and I'm going to marry a man younger than I am, so I won't be a widow. Shall I wear a coat? It's going to be chilly, but a coat won't help any. Maybe you'll help break the ice with your family. Is that what you mean, your family? I'm part of the chill. You'll tell me more about your folks in the drive over, won't you? I'll tell you all about them right now. They don't like communists. Not even you? Especially not even me. Uh, do I have to be a communist? Ask yourself that, not me. I mean to them. Can't I just be a girl you know? Hmm, that might keep things on a pleasanter basis at that. Okay, you're a girl I know. Not partial to black. Or red. 
good. Let's go. Mother, this is Miss Tanya Joseph. I'm happy. And I'm very happy to know you, Matt, Mother. Uh-huh. My younger brother, Tip. Oh, not so much younger. I live right, and he doesn't. Hi, Tanya. Hi. Where's Dad? Oh, he's feeling pretty good, but he'd rather stay home today. Oh, can't I see him before we go? Oh, sure. He's nothing contagious. He likes pretty young girls like you. <laughs> hey, something's cooking. I make something for Papa. Pachinka. I smell Pachinka. Oh, you hear, boy? She knows from Pachinka. She's lived then. Oh, you come to dinner sometime. I make you Pachinka. <laughs> Look, Papa. Look what I bring you for this girl. Off to a fair start, anyhow. It'll work, Tip. We'll have fun. You'll see. Quite a gal there. Hmm. When did you meet up with that? Let's not be disrespectful, younger brother. She's got, what, two years on me? Two years is two years. Where'd you meet her? Why? Can't I ask? You can ask. Why so mysterious? Does she know you're a red? I never told her. Is she? If she's a red, she never told me. That's good enough for me. It'll have to be. Kip, don't get interested in this girl. Please. You're not serious about her, are you? No. And then what's the beef? Well, for one thing... Cute. She's older than you are. That may be. <laughs> but I've lived. It was nice, the picnic. This was home and love and family. This was America and the sweet remembrance of things past. And I knew that I loved it and Mom and Tip and Dad as much as I hated being a communist, even for the FBI. I had enough. I wanted out. The old oaken bucket, the iron-bound bucket, the moss-covered bucket, that hung in the world. Hey, wait a minute. Listen to this one. The old family toothbrush, the Bolshevik toothbrush, the communist toothbrush that hung on the wall. Hear, hear! <laughs> the old family toothbrush, the Bolshevik toothbrush, the communist toothbrush, it was fun. I loved it. Mom and Tip probably thought I was being a good sport about it, not to upset Tanya, who wasn't supposed to know I was a red. But I knew something and knew it surely. I didn't want to be a communist anymore for the FBI or anyone else. I wanted out. Twilight. I sat alone on the river bluff, thinking, finding escape. How? Matt. What? Oh. I've been searching for you. I've been here. Oh. It's a lovely evening. It's been a wonderful day. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. But it's the life our philosophy sneers at. It's bourgeois and hockey. And you love it. I never realized how much I missed it. Only you mustn't think or talk that way. That's why they sent you, isn't it? To see that I didn't fall for the old hokum bucket. Peace and simplicity and sentiment. To police me. Yes. I know the technique. I'm lucky. 
Other backsliders are invited to Moscow to get a refresher course on communism, and they never come back. I'm lucky. I shouldn't say this. I'm sorry for you. I shouldn't say this to you. But I'm not going to the Hiawatha Bowl tonight. They might miss you at the concert. They might not in that crowd. Unless somebody warns them I'll be playing hooky. Somebody. Sonia! Sonia! Oh, here, Tip. What was that? And Tip isn't red bait. I warn you. Hi, Matt. Uh, Sonia, would uh, you help Mom pack up the stuff or she'll never be ready in time for the concert? What concert? Oh, I forgot to tell you. Jacques Sandoz is playing at the bowl and Tip said he'd take me. All of you. You're all my guests tonight. All right. Well, I'll help your mother with the picnic basket now. Tip, there might be trouble at that concert tonight. Well, Tanya wanted to hear Sandoz. They're getting too interested in that girl. Except she isn't of that girl. It's been a good day, Tip. A nice day for all of us. It may never be this way again. I don't want to spoil... Brace yourself, Tip. I've got news for you. Tanya Joseph is a communist. Like you said, Matt, it's been a great day. Like old times. We don't want to spoil it. No. When a commie wants to smear anybody, you call him a commie. Or her. Let's not spoil it, Tip. Then let's all finish the day right and finish it together, huh? I'll go to the concert with you, Tip. Okay. The girl wins. Getting late. Yeah. Later than you think. The big Hiawatha Dell bowl was packed. And packed with dynamite. I kept watching Mom, enjoying every second of it, wondering, how much longer does she have on Earth? I'm in a long, hard fight, and she might go before she learns that her Matty was really on the right side all the time. How much longer? And then the last encore. I watch Tip and Tanya. Tip's face is puzzled. What's that he's playing now, Tom? Revolutionary Eighteen. What's the idea? This Sandoz bum is the guy who stayed set when the national anthem was being played once. Take it easy, Tip. Don't tell me he's playing that revolutionary A2 just by accident. It's a classic, Tim. Plenty of other classics. Why just that? He's a jumping red and everybody knows it. All right. It isn't all right. I like my propaganda music above board, like so. Oh, now, here. Hey, sit the down. Bolshevik toothbrush here. Oh, the communist oh, toothbrush. Oh, the old family oh, toothbrush. Oh, that oh, hung oh, on the wall. Oh, oh, first, oh, we oh, use toothpaste, oh, and then we use powder, oh, and then we oh, use our oh, soap. But now we oh, use oh, lye. Oh, 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 It happens in an instant. The bottle flying over the heads of the crowd and hitting Tip square in the mouth. Tip staggering back, spitting blood, and then sailing into a guy who tries to swing brass knuckles on him. The whole crowd surging and muttering like an angry tide. Fists flying, brick bats, clubs, blackjacks coming out of concealment, and the battle of the bowl is on. But not the way the commies wanted it. Reporting. Couldn't allow you to come down to regular FBI headquarters, Matt. You understand that. How are you? Bruised. Head bloody but unbowed. Excuse me. Have Jerry come in, will you? Thanks. I have a confession to make you, Matt. Anything you say will definitely be used against you. And I'll deserve it, too. But, Matt, I, I knew you had to go on that picnic... But I also knew the deep emotional and sentimental effect a fine day with your family might have on you. I couldn't risk your blurting out the truth to your folks that you were working for the FBI. So, I sent somebody to guard against that. Matt, this is Geraldine. Hello, Matt. Tanya. Or Geraldine, or Norma, or K-124. Or just 
somebody. One of our best FBI girls, Matt, and definitely our best looking. I had to do it, Matt. Line of duty. I thought Zelensky wished you on me. We wanted and expected you to think that. Okay, Matt. Okay. Great. Only we mustn't see each other again. Great. Good work, Matt. Goodbye, Matt. Yeah. You won't crack now, will you? Not for a while, anyway. Maybe when it's all over, Matt. So long. Somebody. That's how it is. It's always goodbye. Goodbye to peace and picnics, family and sentiment. Goodbye to Katie did, swearing in the summer haze and whippoorwills in the dusk. Goodbye to sentiment, the old open bucket. Maybe. When it's all over, Matt. Yeah, maybe. But I chose it this way. I'm a communist for the FBI. I walk alone. Dana Andrews will return in just a moment. This is Dana Andrews with a word about the stories you hear on these programs. Many of them, like the one you've just heard, are founded in fact, but with essential details disguised or modified to protect innocent persons. Next week, another exciting story based on incidents in the nine long years that Matt Svedek spent as an undercover man for the FBI. Be with us then, won't you? Communist for the FBI. Starring Dana Andrews in an exciting tale of danger and espionage, I was a communist for the FBI. the incidents in the story you're about to hear are based on the actual records and authentic experiences of Matt Savetic, who for nine fantastic years lived as a communist for the FBI. Here is our star, Dana Andrews, as Matt Savetic. To use a simile, communism is like a time bomb, innocent enough on the surface, just a box. It isn't until you get inside that you find the dynamite intended to blow you apart. I know because for nine years, I was inside the party. I met the Red Dynamite on its own terms. And one thing I found out while working as an undercover man, you, mister, yes, and you too, lady, you're the target for that Red Explosion. The explosion that was my job to help prevent. In a moment, listen to Dana Andrews as Matt Savetic, undercover man. Sovetic, FBI undercover man. This story from the confidential file is marked The Dangerous Dollars. <laughs> 